for February 20, 2018, I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led tonight by Ruben Amaya, one of the finalists for the student member of the Maryland State Board of Education. I ask then to remain standing for a moment of silence, and particularly this evening in uh, memory of the tragic events last week at Marjorie Stoneham Douglas High School in, Fred in uh, Florida. I pledge the allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on the evening agenda is to consider the agenda. Ms. White, are there any uh, changes or additions? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd ask the board's consideration to add item D1, entitled Student Safety Discussion, to tonight's agenda. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Is there any opposition? A uh, unanimous vote allows the uh, am uh, amendment to the agenda. Thank you. Uh, Sign-up cards were available uh, to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled um, board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening are in the box to my right, and they'll be drawn by Ms. Schaefer and read by Mr. Stewart. Our first speaker is Ruben Amea. Our second speaker is Chris Zach. Our third speaker is Lily Rowe. Our fourth speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferron. Our fifth speaker is Diana Bergman. Our sixth speaker is Glenn Gilhar. And that is it, I am told. Very good. Thank you all. Um, so the uh, uh, amendment to the agenda is now, and I invite Ms. White to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening to Chairman Gillis, Vice Chair Stewart, members of the board, and to the general public. I appreciate the board for allowing me to um, take this time this evening to address the violence that has occurred in our schools and across the nation. Uh, as I stated in my call to all families and to staff members via the school messenger system, safety is our number one priority in BCPS and is our collective responsibility. We have to continue to communicate with one another and to listen to those we serve so that all students and staff members can remain safe in school and at work. Again, a child cannot learn if he or she is scared. So we are going to remain ever vigilant in our practical efforts to ensure student safety and we are grateful for the partnership that we have with our county officials and with the Baltimore County Police Department as well. We do have uh, cameras in our schools and at our office sites. We have a Raptor system that is a school check-in system in place in every school to identify our visitors. We have regular safety drills for students and staff. We also have stringent rules when it comes to weapons in our our schools and we are fortunate to have school resource officers who work alongside us every day to build relationships with students but also to keep our students safe. Last but not least, we also have our staff members and students who not only engage in regular drills in our school system, but who also speak up if they see something that is out of the norm. There is no way to prevent all acts of violence, but we can certainly do everything that we can to prevent them. I'm grateful for the public input that we have received thus far on this topic, and I welcome your voice and your continued suggestions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and I understand our student member, Ms. Schaefer, has a a statement or a comment as well. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. I spent the long great weekend reading articles and watching videos about the shooting that occurred at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Like many students around Baltimore County, I am afraid. 
I quickly identified with the survivors and victims of the shooting because they could have easily lived in Baltimore County. They could have been students in our school system. I, f I feel helpless. We live a thousand miles away from Parkland and no matter how much I could donate to every town, I felt like I could be doing more to not let the shooting end as a hashtag. Then I remember that as student member of the board, I can use my voice for meaningful change. This is not a partisan issue. This is, this is a I am scared to go to a place that I thought was safe issue. I should not be afraid to go to school. My friend should not be stopped as she's about to leave the house because her mom wants her to change into tennis shoes in case she has to run. Parents should not worry that they, they will never see their children again after putting them on the bus. As students, we have the right to get our education without constantly fearing that someone with an assault rifle will enter the building. Something has to change. I call on the board to vocally support the March for Our Lives on March 24th. Countless of Baltimore County students will be attending this march, and it is important to know that our board supports us. Show that you are listening to the students in our system and all over the country that are now using their voice to say that enough is enough. We look to the adults in our county to help elevate our voices, and I hope that you will support our students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. White, and thank you, Ms. Schaefer. Uh, next item on I'd like our... to... Oh, certainly, Mr. Thank Ulfutter. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that the board uh, send an appropriate letter of condolence and support to the Broward County School Board. I think it's important for our voice to be heard. Um, and I would suggest, I would like to make that motion. I hope someone will second it. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, there will be a letter over on the side table for everyone to sign later this evening. All right, our next item, uh, Mr. Hayden. I'd like to reiterate. Microphone. I'd like to reiterate the motion that I had made and failed in budget, which was adding SROs to school. I believe it's very necessary, and to think that we can get along with what we have, I think, is not realistic in today's world. I think the board should take this up and the superintendent or the interim superintendent and staff should give us input on it. We don't have enough people in the schools, uh, SROs, who can patrol the schools and give us m more comfort that our uh, young people are protected. Very good. Thanks. So now, our next. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities for board to hear uh, the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent. We encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, uh, but this is not the appropriate time to address specific student or employee matters. We encourage everyone to utilize existing uh, resolution opportunities for that. I may remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior is, is inappropriate. I ask you to observe the three-minute clock and conclude your remarks when your time expires. I do note, and, I'm, uh, and I know the rest of the board joins me in uh, recognizing two elected officials here. We are always pleased that elected officials uh, are concerned uh, enough about our school system to dedicate their time to join us here. Uh, and I invite uh, both Delegate Ebersaw and Councilman Quirk to come forward and to speak in that order. I'd just like to start by saying that while the school system bears responsibility for keeping students safe, at the state level, we bear responsibility for safe gun ownership as well, and we're taking it very seriously, so thank you all. After several years of being repeatedly informed by the county executive that the county did not have the funds for brand new high schools, only renovations, I have been surprised by the recent announcement that the new high school is being planned for Delaney, and that a new high school is being considered at Towson. And I ask a straightforward question. What about Lansdowne? If Delaney, which just as Lansdowne had been told their enrollment didn't support a new school, has now qualified based on the projections of a new study, did not Lansdowne's projections possibly change as well, given Lansdowne is currently at 2020 projected capacity? ESOL magnet with growing ESOL population community will continue to get students there that are geographically assigned to other schools. The enrollment projections indicating no additional seats 
seem like they may have fallen into inaccuracy. I would like to see the projections to have a feel for that. And how did Towson suddenly rise to the top of the list to be considered for a previously unaffordable new school? While the planned renovation is termed as complete, it is not a new school, and the community has noted several concessions they feel they are making in a renovation plan, including a cafeteria that will still need expansion, classrooms that are relatively small, and a hallway known as Sunshine Alley that still causes bottlenecks in student movement, especially for disabled and handicapped students. If the funding stream is now there for the new schools, then I think we should open the tap. It should include money for Lansdowne High School so the school can be fully state-of-the-art right down to a new auditorium. Lansdowne High's need is just as great to improve the facility. The building's old, students deserve better, and if the money is there now to replace it, Lansdowne should be included. At the state level, we make significant contributions to school construction. We do not direct it, but we would like to see it used responsibly, fairly, and transparently. I hope you, the school board, will take whatever actions you find appropriate to ensure that Lansdowne is treated equally and is in line for a new high school as well as the others. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Thank you. Councilman. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Debersall, for standing up in support of Lansdowne. And the first thing I'd like to say, if anybody in the audience is here supporting Lansdowne High School, can you please stand up? Thank you all for coming tonight, really appreciate it. And uh, thank you to the community for all their hard work and volunteer hours in helping and advocating for Lansdowne High School. And I'd also like to thank Nick Stewart as well for really leading the charge and helping us. And um, I came here not long ago, obviously, supporting a substantial $60 million renovation for Lansdowne High School, as all of you know. And now, suddenly and unexpectedly and quite candidly overnight, County Executive Kevin Cavanagh changed the rules and he changed the criteria and suddenly said that Delaney High School gets a new high school. And given that Lansdowne is in the worst shape of any high school, including Delaney, it is logical and not only logical but imperative that Lansdowne also receives a new high school. The fiscal reality, and I chair the County Spending Affordability Committee, so I, I speak as an authority on this, is that our capital budget, candidly, currently our capital budget allows one new high school. And many of the planners thought that that was going to be Towson High School, very candidly. And even with just one new high school, not two or three new high schools, the fact of the matter is our overall debt capacity is constrained. Our maximum debt service limit, as Roger Hayden could tell you better than anyone, is 9.5% debt service limit. That's the maximum. Currently, just with one new high school, we're exceeding 10% that with one new high school, not two and not three. And obviously there's pressing needs around the county, so Lansdowne and Delaney are not in this alone. I mean, look at the issues the board faces with the Southeast. Look at the issues that the board faces with the Northeast. There's many, many pressing problems. And so I think it's even more imperative with the help of this board that we do need a 10-year capital plan, a 10-year capital plan that's based on merit that's based on sound planning, and it's not, especially not based on politics. I think this is really important that we do not pit one school against the other trying to divide and conquer. This is all of us in this together. This is not Delaney versus Lansdowne. This is all high schools together, working together to try to fix up our schools and make our schools the best we possibly can. The fact of the matter is if we want things, we're going to have to pay for them. There's going to be pressing and challenging decisions that have to be made, but what other priority than getting our best schools for our students, whether it's at Lansdowne or whether it's Delaney or whether it's any place else, is there any better priority as citizens of Baltimore County than to invest in our schools and invest in our kids? And so I just want to say that we, that we, we need a new Lansdowne High School. We demand a new Lansdowne High School and we ask for your support. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilman. <laughs> it's not now time for the uh, advisory and stakeholder groups, and the first um, is the Baltimore County Student Council, and that's Jake Turner. Mr. Turner.
Good evening, board. Um, my name is Jake Turner, um, and I'm the president of the Baltimore County Student Councils. Usually, I report to the I report about what BCSC has been up to. Tonight, however, I feel that there is something more urgent to talk about. Students from all over the country and all over Baltimore County are plagued by the growing fear of a safety threat while in our schools. The threat is real, with 18 school shootings so far in 2018 that have resulted in death or injury. That number is completely unacceptable. Even BCPS has had its fair share of gun threats, including Lock Raven High School last week. I commend the way that BCPS, the Baltimore County Police Department, and the Lock Raven students, teachers, administrators, and community members handled the situation that occurred. Fortunately, no one was hurt, but that does not mean that we will be so lucky next time. Something needs to be done within our schools to keep us safe. School shootings can often, though not all the time, be traced back to student mental health needs, something that can be managed and affects all aspects of student life. There needs to be more support staff and resources available for students because no student should ever struggle alone with mental health needs, and if they do, then the school needs to be there for them. Our health as students is more important than our grades and our test scores. We need to continue our efforts against bullying in schools and reinforce that there is no shame in having a mental health need, just as there is no shame of having a physical ailment. Additionally, while drills are great and needed, great and needed, many students feel as though in the case of an emergency, all of that will go out the window. The students I talked to push the need for drills, especially the lockdown drills, to be carefully reviewed and if need be, be altered to ensure maximum student safety. As a county, we need to review and enforce policies that safeguard students, such as through the ID card implementation and securing school, door, or school entrances. I don't want to go in school in fear, knowing that there's a chance that a gun will be brought on to my campus. No student should ever be afraid to go to school, and no teacher should ever worry that violence could occur. That does not make for a good learning environment. I urge the board to take actions by encouraging open conversations, strengthening student mental health resources, and establishing and enforcing updated safety measures and protocols. I will not sit by and allow a tragedy like the one at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School to come to Baltimore County. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Our next constituent group is TABCO, and I invite Abby Baton to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Ms. White, and members of the board. Our schools should be safe havens for our students and families. Our places of worship should be safe havens as well. We should be able to attend a concert and not think that some senseless massacre may happen here. There is no place that is safe from the kinds of attacks we are seeing across our nation. I do not think locking down our schools is the answer because just like the hundreds of guns that get through the security system at the airports, the same will happen at our We can't put a false sense of security in place and think that is the answer. I even heard in one report, maybe we should lock the schools down like prisons. Is this really what we want for our kids, to attend prisons to receive their education? The answer lies within all of us. Every time we espouse hate toward others, it comes back to us tenfold. Every time we turn a blind eye to someone who has been bullied, or is different, or is a bully, it comes back to us tenfold. Every time we talk about others and don't make sure our neighbors have been made to feel welcomed in our neighborhoods, it comes back to us tenfold. We must help our parents understand their responsibilities in their neighborhoods. We all need to be watching for the signs and report what needs to be reported, but also work toward helping those who are struggling before they are at a point where they think violence is the answer. You have heard me many times and again ask for the supports needed in our schools. With the extra staff trained to work with struggling students and their families in place, we will have much better outcomes for our students. We know some of these positions are in the budget for next year, but we need to do more. 
The students from the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida have stood up and said, we are not going to take this anymore. We are tired of waiting and watching others get hurt. I applaud them for their willingness to take the issue head on. They are setting the path to finding answers to these horrific acts. We must follow their lead and act now to make a difference for all of our sakes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baton. Our next speaker is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, and that's P.J. Schaefer. Good evening, members of the board, Ms. White. Uh, I'm P.J. Schaefer. I'm the former chair of the CCAC. Uh, I'm going to start with the definition. Transition services means a set of activities for a child with a disability that is designed to be results-oriented process that is focused on improving the academic and functional achievement of the child with a disability to facilitate the post-secondary education, vocational education, integrated employment, including supported employment, continuing and adult education, adult services, independent living, or community participation is based on the individual child's needs, taking into account the child's strengths, preferences, and interests. In simple language, the goal of transition planning is to assist students with disabilities in school as they prepare for life after or in the adult world. By law, it's supposed to start at age 14. In reality, most students see it at age 16, somewhere in 10th or 11th grade. Students should be exposed to career training in middle school uh, so that they can get an idea what they want. If they need to go to a vocational program, they have to be at a school that actually offers a vocational program. Not all of our high schools do. BCPS has 12 transition facilitators. There are 28 high schools. The transition facilitators are also supposed to be working with the students in middle schools, but that's not happening. Way too many students today graduate and or age out because they don't actually graduate or get a certificate um, and end up sitting on mom and dad's couch. Unemployment for persons with disabilities is much higher than regular population. We need to do a better job of preparing students to do more. The special ed uh, department has asked for three and a half more positions for transition facilitators. We strongly support that. We ask you to do more for transition services for students with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the PTA Council of Baltimore County. That's Jane Lee. I haven't been here in a while, but Leslie's done a good job. I'm going to read you a part of what the National PTA statement, not the whole thing since I only have three minutes. It is online. They say it is urgent that families, educators, school administrators, community leaders, and elected officials work together to find solutions and make meaningful changes to ensure that all students have a safe environment in which to thrive and learn. Any act of violence at a school or involving children and youth is intolerable. Every student deserves to learn and grow in a safe environment, and no parent should fear for the safety of their child every time they leave home for school. I will add, and no teacher should have to give their life up to protect those children. It remains a top priority of PTA to promote safety for children and youth and improve education. We have a strong history of supporting and advocating for policies in the area of gun safety, violence prevention, juvenile justice, mental health, and students' overall well-being. We are committed to supporting students, families, schools, and communities in coping with and preventing violence. We offer a variety of resources, and they can be, they can be downloaded at pta.org slash school safety. A school must be a safe haven. Safe haven. P National PTA has a position statement on firearms. We support federal restriction on firearms that would require a waiting period and background check to screen out illegal purchasers, such as convicted felons and drug offenders. 
We want to outlaw military-style semi-automatic assault weapons, and we want to require knowledge of appropriate firearms use and safety practices. There is a bill put in Annapolis. It, there's a hearing. It's a House Bill 760, handguns, school employees, handgun permits, and carrying weapons on school property. We will be speaking against that bill, which would allow school boards and school systems to members of the school system to carry a handgun on school property only if it is secured on the person's body. That is the job of the SROs. We do not live in the Wild West. We need more support staff. We've been saying this all year. I will also allude to the screen time because, again, I wish to say that the more time these children spend on the screen, the less time they have to develop interpersonal relationships and the less time teachers have to weed out problems that students are having. We're asking for your help in that. Thank you. I will be there on the 24th. Our next speaker is from the Area Education Advisory Council on the Northeast, and that's Lily Lee. Dear BOE members, I'm here to report concerns and suggestions from stakeholders' Northeast community at our February monthly meeting. Some suggestions saying use the $1.8 million budgeted for, for traveling conference to be used for more staffing instead. Some concerns, non consequences for better behaviors, only consider better kids' rights but not good kids. Suggest suggestions, equitable rights. Some concerns, inappropriate cell phone use at the class, school overcrowding, lack of support for needy kids. Some concerns, violent disruptive behaviors, students' home life parenting problem, suggesting smaller classroom, more staffing social workers, do time out discipline, and hold the parents accountable for their children's behavior. Some concerns, violent behaviors is toured at a school, overcrowding of a school and a bus, Again, students not aware of rules and consequences and lack of communication to communities. Suggestions, more supporting staffing conferences for all students to understand the rules, inform community. Concerns, no dress code, no respect for teachers, repeat violent offenders at a school. Suggestions, uniforms, parent involvement. Some concerns, sexual harassment, bullying, fighting weapons, etc. at a school. Suggestions, Early intervention at the elementary school, need resources or special, sc or special schools. Some concerns, who's holding schools accountable? Some suggestions, more strict consequences for better behavior, build more schools. Some concerns for perihor middle, need monitoring of students going to trailers. Overcrowding, need more staff to monitor cameras, need to link SRO numbers to school sites. Some suggestions. Need SROs in elementary. Need the parents to assist the schools. Some suggestions. Need more helpers in class. Need to audit residency home class, home edges. Some concerns. Too much emphasis on test. Suggestions. Need the teacher's support and more resources. Also, one school in particular, Seven Oaks Elementary, a feeding school to Perry Hall Middle and Perry Hall High, had great safety and discipline problems. Parents reported sexual harassment, hitting, bullying, and other virus, and other various kinds of violent behaviors happening there. School didn't address those concerns, though parents reported to principal and filed bullying harassment forms. Please, uh, parents couldn't find other channels and had to turn to our area superintendent, George Roberts, for help. Please help us follow up on this issue. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Now it's time for public comment, and our first speaker is Ruben Amaya. Double duty tonight. Good evening, members of the board. I just wanted to give a few remarks on the tragic event that occurred last week. 
No doubt that what happened was a senseless and sadistic act of violence, and I give my sincerest condolences to those who died and those suffering today. Though a positive thing that has come out of this is students advocating and coming together to solve issues. And this goes beyond gun violence. It's a very rare thing in our country to see the youth speak up and advocate. And this is something we need to encourage much more often within our education system, because eventually it will one day be the youth that make the important decisions as you are right now. And it's true that many adults do not take children and teenagers seriously, but we too are citizens of this country and are affected by the legislations our lawmakers pass. So I hope that in today's society, the Board of Education and educators continue to push students to speak up and rise to the occasion when it is necessary, because we need it now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Zack. Chris Zack. Members of the board, as president of the Relay Improvement Association, as treasurer of the Lansdowne High School PTSA, I bring you warm and fraternal greetings from both communities on what is now a very, very warm night. Members, it's come to my attention that there's been a lot of complexities, so to speak, going on with the planned renovations to Lansdowne High School. Apparently, politics seems to be getting involved. Promises are being made all over the place, statements quoted. The concept of fairness is one that's being bounced around a lot. Members, I'd like to talk about FAIR for a moment here. Lansdowne PTSA has been working on the situation in Lansdowne for the past four years, and other people have been doing it before us. The needed renovations to make an appropriate educational environment have been delayed time and time again. Each time for a different reason, each time for something. Nothing is getting done. The latest renovations, totaling $60 million, if I recall, is one that's been presented and appears to be one where we will replace everything except the windows because the windows are new, so I'm glad they're keeping them. But I like that in a way. I like the fact the renovations have been planned, reviewed, and are scheduled to begin this June. Not next year, not five years down the road, not at some unknown time. Fixing these issues is fair. That needs to be done. Kicking this down the road and continuing to go year after year with it is not fair. These renovations, as I said, are years overdue. The condition of the school has now gotten to the point where they need to be done now. Not five years down, not down the road, they need to be done now. Thus, I request the board continue to support and vote to approve the renovation as long as it is what we have been promised, which is a full and complete renovation, keeping only the windows. And I say again, this needs to start now. It is critical. The people, the kids in the school need air conditioning. They need clean bathrooms. They need locker rooms that work. They need a stage that works. They need classrooms that have a reasonable size and reasonable accommodations for them. The list can just go on and on. Heck, they need clean water for heaven's sakes. They need the pipes replaced. If this money is magically there and we can begin construction of a new school now, you know, immediately type thing, then by all means, please begin construction of a new school. That would be great. I'll start the first bulldozer. But I'll be honest, if this is just political hay being thrown around by various different people, do us a favor and tell it like it is and vote knowing that we need this renovation now. Not in five years, not down the road, now. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lily Rowe. I don't know how many of you remember Larry Schmidt. He was the chair of the board for a while. And he was the chair when I first started coming and paying attention to the Board of Education meetings. And there was a thing that he used to talk about. And every so often you'd hear him say, when is that 10-year plan coming? And eventually I learned that he meant the facilities audit. And the facilities audit, if you read it, doesn't really look like a plan. It just looks like a list of what's wrong with every single school. But if you go in the back of the facilities audit, there's a bunch of tables. And those tables outlined how we were going to have a list of projects that would eliminate elementary school overcrowding. And there was one high school that was recommended to be completely rebuilt, one, which was Lansdowne High School. And they estimated that it would cost 
about $67 million. And then if you look at the square footage formulas now from the Board of Public Works, the Board of Public Works thinks maybe $80 million. You could do it. We have had no substantial change overall over the county in elementary school overcrowding. When I look at the maps of the new data, there's still massive elementary school overcrowding. Now we have middle and high school problems. And we've spent $1.3 billion, is that right? $1.3 billion. And we still have a lot of problems because it hasn't been done in a way that had any kind of a plan or organization to it. We can't have school facilities issues being decided by a county executive who every year changes his mind about Ricer's Hell Elementary is getting a new school. Well, no, now we have to spend $300 million accelerating Central AC because $10 million on portable would be not politically good for him. I, there, there's so much stuff that's going on that I would really like to see a transparent, independent way of deciding based on some formula waiting need and population to get these facilities projects done so that every community can see on a list when their community's needs will be met. I'm running in Council 6. Almost every single area in Council 6 has severe overcrowding at the elementary level. And there's one elementary school opening, nothing being done about Pleasant Plains, Oakley, and Villa Cresta, and there's not even a conversation about it. So we've been messing around with this for a very long time, and I think it's time to do something substantial in the form of real planning. And I hope that all of you start talking to county government to make that happen. Our next speaker, our next speaker is Dr. Bosch Farone. Good evening to all. Evening. 14 years of uh, attending the Board of Education. And every time there is a project, experts in the school behind me would say that building a new school is far better than renovation. Renovation costs money, it drags and drags and accumulates. And I, I really think it is time really to replace Lansdowne, especially that Delaney is being replaced. Security is also very important, no doubt about it. If schools are not secure, it, it's really a problem for everybody. The best way really to deal with an active shooter is to have a professional who is armed, who is really facing that person early on in the process. And building on my high school in my older days, the school needs to be secure far away. You know, it doesn't really start right at the door because if you have somebody who's carrying heavy guns, I mean, they could be spotted right entering the school or something like that far away. So we really need to address that issue in more than one way. Pressure cannot really, a prayer cannot really do it. Condolences, as good as they are, they will not really do it. And really tearing a school down would not really uh, uh, solve the problem. Uh, so with that, I want to harp a little bit on what I talked to you in many years before. Oftentimes, we really rightfully so brag how big we are, how good we are in relation to others. I think it's really important that we focus on how good and excellent we are, all right? And I told you many times it's not as important to focus on grades and graduation, but also to focus on ethics. Because the problem is not just really guns. It's the problem that how we are really training and educating our children to be good citizens in the future. It really makes no sense to have somebody who is a physics whiz graduating to the best university to be a unibomber as an example, or somebody who has evil minds. Uh, so teaching the ethics and what's right and what's wrong really in the school system is very important in addition to grades. Last but not least, I want to mention to you that of the 30 cases of uh, active shooting that happened, only one or two have been done by Muslim Americans. So it's really important that we really don't stereotype people. We give equal 
um, liberty and justice for all, equal holidays, equal you know, school building, etc., and not really look for easy solutions, that does not really mount up to a solution uh, as we probably see in some of the proposals. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diana Bergman. Greetings, everybody. I'm going to get right to the point. We need a 10 year plan that's fair for everybody. Every single person, every single student, every single educator in Baltimore County. When we look at these aging infrastructure, because everybody knows I'm a Florida girl. I grew up in Florida, went to high school in Florida, 3,000 students in my high school. My graduating class in Miami-Dade County, just 160 students short of Lansdowne High School's population. What we had over there that you guys don't have here as your population starts to grow is that we had security teams at the middle school and the high school level. They were employed by our school district, a security team at the school that didn't carry a gun. What they carried was leadership and mentoring skills. They became friends with us, us kids, and they helped and guide us and set a positive example. And each middle school and high school, depending on the, how high the population was, either had one SRO or two. So this renovation about Lansdowne does not change the blueprint. It doesn't make our classrooms any larger. It does not make our hallways any larger. It's an odd-shaped building. We have to look at these aging infrastructure and how safe they are in the time that we live today. I haven't seen a single mention of our first responders or our police department sitting down through the planning process of any construction work of facilities in Baltimore County. It is sad. Over 3,000 students in a high school and 17 lives were lost. And believe me, trust me when I say that was a lucky low number. But they had safety procedures and chance and we're growing rapidly. We have some of our building layouts that have blind spots. Even if we put a camera up, it does nothing to make us safer. We have current overcrowding issues right now. We need a plan that's gonna address the needs of today in a fair, balanced way, a 10-year plan. Of course, I want a new Lansdowne High School. I've been saying that for over three years. I haven't budged not for a second about that. But as we move forward, we need to think about the times we live today, and we gotta make all our construction projects fair, equitable for everybody in Baltimore County, and they have to be safer. Because let me tell you, Lansdowne Middle School is a nightmare, solid building. It's not even overcrowded yet. But the layout of that building is extremely dangerous with the time we live today, and we want to prevent that. Our next speaker is Glenn Gielhar. Good evening, Interim Superintendent Verlita White, distinguished members of the Board of Education. Thank you all so much for your service to our school children. Um, I'm here to say that Lansdowne, I live in Parkville, but Lansdowne needs a new high school. Um, my oldest daughter went to Lansdowne High School. She was very sick there. She has high mold allergies. There's mold in the school. This was about 10 years ago, and nothing's really changed there. Um, I see we have a real opportunity here to, instead of renovating the school, to, uh, to do like we did in Carver, to build a new school next to the old school, and then tear the old school down, replace the athletic field. I worked in Carver, I think it could work in Lansdowne. Um, now, as I said, I went to Parkville Elementary, middle, high school, and back in 1978, a lot of our elementary level schools, and we're still paying the price for that right now, based on planning, were closed. Rosedale Elementary, Parkville Elementary, other ones have been reopened, those still, still are closed. Um, 
so, so these planning numbers sometimes are, are wrong. And what they, they seem to look at when I see these PowerPoints and planning sessions is they strictly look at numbers and birth rates. But the thing that they don't look at is the impact that our schools have on our communities. Um, in Lansdowne, I think a new school would, would breathe some new life into that community uh, that a renovation would, would not do. Uh, I think you'd have an opportunity for investment, private sector investment, growth, people wanting to live there where there's a brand new state-of-the-art school. Um, coming back closer to, to my area, um, in Rosedale, uh, it's widely speculated that the Golden Ring Middle School is, is gonna be closed when the new Northeast School opens. Uh, also, Rosedale just lost their Catholic school, St. Clement's closed this past year. Uh, and then the Rosedale Elementary School was, was closed, uh, with, like I said, with Parkville. So that's gonna be a community without any school really of its own. Um, schools add so much. Again, when we lost uh, Parkville, we lost our fun fair, we lost our, our, a lot of our community parades. Um, I think that same thing could happen in Rosedale. And right now, the old Rosedale Elementary has proven that it can be used as a school. It's being used right now as the temporary home of Victory Villa. So what I would like to see is keep that school open. It's been open the last two years. Keep it open, rezone it uh, as Rosedale Elementary School, and scratch the... Um, the addition at Red House Run. The answer is not a bigger Red House Run. Uh, the answer is right there. You have a school building that's right now operating as a school that could be used. And those funds for that multi-million dollar renovation, perhaps that could be used, or maybe that could be the difference uh, for Lansdowne and getting their new school. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gilhart. <laughs> Next on our agenda is item F, and that's personnel matters, and I invite Dr. Mayo to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Superintendent White, members of the boards. I would like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements and resignations. Is there a motion to approve the personnel matters in exhibits F1 and F2? So moved. Uh, is there a second? second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Thank Mayo. You. Next is item G, action taken in closed session. I invite Mr. Nussbaum to come forward. Good evening. Earlier this evening, the board uh, considered an a, a, a matter uh, in your quasi-judicial capacity. That was a matter that came from the Ethics Review Panel. It is uh, com complaint number 17C, ERP01. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the action that the board took in closed session in that matter. All right. Is there a motion uh, to approve the action taken in closed session? Is there a second? Do we need Mr. Stewart here? I think we do. Hmm? Yeah, all, right. all right. So we have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session. Uh, all in favor of that motion, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I call for division, please. All right, you want to call the roll? No. Yes. No. Mr. McDaniels. Yes. Ms. Miller. No. Mr. Stewart. Yes. Mr. Wolfelder. Yes. Mr. Birch. Aye. Mr. Schaefer. Yes. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. The order's on the table. Signature. Uh, next on the agenda is item H, a report on, uh, work session report on the proposed naming of the new Northeast Elementary School. And I invite Mr. Roberts, who's already forward, <coughs> to speak. Good evening, Chair Gillis, Vice Chair Stewart, Superintendent White, members of the board. This evening I bring forward for your consideration the community recommendation 
for the naming of the new Northeast Elementary School at Joppa Road. And as part of the $1.3 billion capital plan schools for our future, BCPS is scheduled to open its newest elementary school in the Northeast area. The school will add 725 seats to support the increased student capacity and relieve overcrowding in the area. The naming of the school moves us one step closer to opening in August 2018. In accordance with Board of Education policy and Rule 7520, an initial survey was issued to the community in the fall of 2017. For the purpose of receiving suggestions for the new name for the new Northeast Elementary School at Joppa Road. Notifications of this survey were communicated via press release and placement on the BCPS website for the duration of the survey. For the initial survey, 788 votes were recorded from the community with two names identified as the most popular names. Honeygo Elementary School with 327 votes or 41.4% and Honeygo Run Elementary School with 313 votes or 39.7% of the votes. A final survey was issued to the community in December 2017 to solicit input on the final two names that the community voted on. Again, notification of the survey was communicated via press release and placement on the BCPS website. The results of the final community survey are on your screen now, where Honeygo Elementary School received 3,095 votes, or 59.2%, and Honeygo Run Elementary School received 2,133 votes, or 40.8%. Public comment for the proposed naming of the new Northeast Elementary School is scheduled for March 6, 2018, with a vote by the full board scheduled for April 17, 2018. This is the first reading. So prior to taking any questions you may have, I wanted to take an opportunity to introduce the principal, uh, potentially Honeygo Elementary School, but the new Northeast Elementary School at Joppa Road, Charlene Benke is joining us. I want to thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, I am here to answer. Are there them. questions at this time of Mr. Roberts? Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Thank you. Next on our agenda is item I. It's a work session report, an update on facilities, and I think we have Mr. Smith and Mr. Dixit to come forward. Chairman Gillis, Madam Superintendent, members of the board, I'm joined this afternoon with uh, Mr. Pete Dixit, who will give you a brief update on our facilities. Um, over the uh, se several few years, we've been actively involved in um, our Schools for Our Future program, which is $1.3 billion. There's been quite a bit of activity going on, but this update here is going to be more so on um, the true breadth and depth of what happens each and every day in facilities to include ACs, general maintenance, as well as facilities and the host of other things that we do each and every day. With that being said, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Pete Dixit who will go through uh, our quick presentation and will be available for questions. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith, and good evening, Chair good Gillis, evening. Vice Chair Stewart, uh, Superintendent and members of the board. Uh, just to start with, as you know, today is a nice day, but for the last few weeks we had extreme cold, and there were a lot of emergency issues that were brought to our attention as a result of that cold. So just want to give you some statistics that we received more than 182 emergencies, and all of them were resolved. None of the schools closed because of any mechanical issues. So I just want to thank our staff, our team, maintenance and operations team, who did a outstanding job in taking care of those issues. Uh, the second issue I have is the energy performance contract. If you recall, uh, about a year ago, board had approved two different energy performance contracts, and the work is proceeding on those contracts with the same schedule that we had set, the f so one of them to be completed in July and the other one to be completed early in 2019. Those contracts will impact 147 schools in one way or the other with mechanical and uh, systemic improvements to the building. In addition to that, there were five schools, uh, middle schools, where the air conditioning was completed as part of those performance contract, performance, energy performance contract. In the construction area, you know about the capacity issues in the southwest area and 
uh, Westchester Elementary, Catonsville, and West Town, all of those schools, and including the Relay Elementary schools, are complete. Uh, Lance Down Elementary schools, construction is on schedule and is targeted for completion in August 2018. For Northeast area, Victory Villa, Northeast at Joppa, designs were completed, the contract have been awarded, and construction is about 50 to 60 percent complete. Our target date continues to be August 2018 for all of these three schools. A preliminary design evaluation is currently being prepared for the new Northeast area at the Ridge Road, and uh, we expect to complete the design, start the design very soon. Uh, the second school in the Northeast area, the middle school, uh, is in the design phase. Uh, very soon we'll be bringing the design to you, and we are projecting opening for September 2021. For central area, Padonia International Elementary School, uh, the additions that board approved about 18 months ago have been successfully completed ahead of schedule, and the students have been relocated, and the children are very excited about the new facility, the renovated facilities, and the addition. The Dumbarton Middle School is almost 90% complete and is going to be opening uh, com the project completion in June 2018. For the Southeast area, construction contract for Dundalk Elementary School was approved by the board on February 6th, and uh, we are pretty soon going to be starting construction there in the month of March. Colgate Elementary School is in design with the demolition of the old building slated to begin this summer. And uh, in the March 6th board meeting, we are scheduling uh, a review by the board for the preliminary design for the Colgate, and the construction remains for the January 2019. For the high school initiative, Patapsco and Woodlawn High School have started, and they are almost 30% complete, and we are projecting substantial completion by August of 2019. Board is aware of the redesign efforts of Lansdowne High School. The enhanced design uh, for the renovation was shared at the community meeting. Uh, I'd like to thank board member Nick Stewart for facilitating the dialogue with the community. Our target is to bring the contract to the board in the April meeting. Uh, the high school study contract was approved by the board in January and future plans, uh, this, this, the result of this study will assist us in the future plan for the high school renovation and construction. And the planning for replacement schools for Delaney and Towson High School, they have been included in the capital improvement program. In addition to construction projects, there have been systemic projects including roof replacement, uh, project for Essex and Middlesex elementary schools are complete. Construction work is going on on Chesapeake High School, Ridge Ruxton, and Woodmore Elementary School, and it's about 40 to 50 percent complete with a targeted completion for March um, of this year. There are several other roofing projects under design, and that includes Cromwell Valley Elementary School, Hillcrest Elementary School, Orems Elementary Schools, Parkville High School, Timber Grove Elementary School. The air conditioning projects, as I shared with you earlier, you know, the classroom air conditioning is completed for the elementary schools and middle schools as scheduled. Uh, the, the, the classrooms were air conditioned at the time of opening in 2017. And the two high schools, Franklin and Kenwood, the project is ongoing and we are on schedule. 50 to 60 percent work is complete and we are targeting air conditioning for the school opening this year at those two schools. Uh, security initiative, as part of the security initiative, uh, the elementary schools were completed in January 2016, middle were completed in the summer of 2017, and most of the high school, with the exception of the schools that are under renovation or planned for renovation, or already have high technology equipment in there, all other high schools should be completed by April 2018. These projects are all ahead of schedule. There were several site projects that are being done, Halstead Academy, 
Overly High School, targeted for completion in summer 2018, and site work for Orems, Hernwood, Deer Park, and Patapsco are under design and targeted for completion during the summer of 2018. I'd like to conclude my report by uh, sharing with you that there has been extensive discussion about air conditioning and seats. And since we started in 2011-12 school year, there have been a net gain of 3,058 seats. And additionally, between now and school year 21 and 22, two new elementary schools and several school additions are projected to be completed resulting in a net gain of more than 5,000 elementary seats in this time period. Also in 2011, we embarked upon the plan for central air conditioning. At the time we started, number of air, centrally air conditioned buildings were 85 to 90. Since then, air conditioning has been added to 69 schools, which has improved the learning environment for 42,600 kids. The classroom air conditioning for the two additional high school, which is projected to be completed in August 2018, will add the, will increase the number to 46,200 students, where we have improved the learning environment in such a short amount of time. By the beginning of the next school year, only eight schools will be without air condition, four elementary and four high school, seven of which are already in construction or design. Uh, with the exception of one school, we are projecting that all schools will have air conditioning by school year 2021 and 22. That concludes my report. I know I went real fast. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer that. Wow. So we ha we'll start over here, go around. Mr. Virch, and I see Mr. Stewart has his hand raised as well. Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, good evening. Um, I want to just direct your attention to a comment that you made and uh, which uh, you referenced in the update on facilities, and that's with regard to security enhancements. Could you take a moment and share with my colleagues just what you're referring to when you, when you reference that? The security project included adding the camera technology and the buzzer system to all the schools. So, most of the schools had some kind of cameras. This increase the number of cameras and equip the schools with modern state-of-the-art cameras. So for example, if a school may have five or 10 or 15 cameras, that may have now anywhere from 30 to 50 cameras. And it has a lot more capability in terms of finding exactly um, where the security issues might be. And that was uh, completed for all the elementary schools, is that correct? The elementary and middle schools are completed and most of the high schools are completed. The only ones that we haven't done are the ones that are awaiting renovation or construction. Now with regard to these cameras and being able to access these cameras, um, the county government has also you know, embarked on, a, on an ability for an interface between our county police department and the school system. These camera upgrades for elementary schools or middle schools and which will now be going to the high schools, they will be part of that same interface? That's absolutely right. Okay. Thank That's you. That's an effort to continue our safety efforts. It's an ongoing, ever-changing environment, working with our county partners in the police department, as well as some of the improved technologies that we have in working with our principals and school communities every day, trying to make sure that we're providing the safest environment possible, yes. Now, I note that my neighbor in Perry Hall, Julie Henn, is it was unable to attend tonight. But she, like I, and I'm sure all my colleagues share very, very bona fide concerns about security. Order has to precede learning. We have to have safe environments. Should Julie Henn, my colleague, or Emory Young, who is also not here tonight, have any specific questions about security or any of the other matters identified in the summary here that you've shared with us, they certainly can contact you and you're available to answer any questions that they might have. Is that right as well? That's, That's correct. True. Okay. Now, I'd like to ask you if I could about some of the other um, uh, references made in regard to the, uh, to the update that you provided us with. In here, you make reference about during the deep freeze period, that period of January 2nd through the 11th, and you make specific reference of 182 emergency calls related to heating issues and cold weather emergencies. Could you please just share what you, because words have meaning, the term emergency um, could you, you know, how do you define that, you know, that term emergency? 
Emergency's definition is when it impacts life, health, safety, I or see. it creates a condition where we may not be able to provide safe instruction. So these calls, they were for, a lot of them were for uh, frozen pipes, for uh, frozen coils, for, uh, you know, the, the, the problems Im impacted the school that it could have closed if the immediate action was not taken. <laughs> I see. Give I know. You, Go ahead. Give you an example of one. Um, some of the issues that we had with the frigid coal were water main breaks. Yeah. They happen outside of the school, but it affects the mm. operation of the school. So as that water goes off, that system, that community may be without water. At that particular time, we have to work closely with the water department as well as BG&E and other partners that we have in order to do that to make sure that we can timely and quickly get that school that area, that community back up and running so that the instructional process does not become delayed. Once again, out of the 182, they run the gamut from frozen pipes to uh, water main breaks to um, electrical issues, you, you name it. It's, it runs the gamut because of the uh, frigid cold temperatures that we had and uh, branches and, and things falling on, on power lines that would impact the school. All of those are part of that emergency situation we have. And in the case of at least one high school, we had frozen we had frozen commodes. That's correct. Uh, that being that being Kenwood High School. Yes, sir. Uh, but that but that was but that was addressed, and that's right. Yes, now, as I understand, there were uh, there were there was this number of emergencies, but there are still some where um, there hasn't been complete um, there hasn't been a complete addressing of those. Yes, and that's that's about a, uh, just under a dozen or so. Yes. And what's the plan for those? Some of the projects that we have are um, projects <laughs> that. Um, what the damage is, is rather extensive. It can't be done in a few days. However, we want to, as little as possible, to impact the instructional programming that's taking place. So we have to find times, whether it's on the weekends or at night or later on during the year, maybe during the summer where we can take that school or that section of the building offline to make those repairs. Um, one piece I didn't add during that discussion we had um, with the frigid cold temperatures, we have a protocol that we try to use to, we have to sometimes call staff in to man these buildings because we do have a, a, a vast um, infrastructure related to age and so sometimes we have to have staff in during the weekends and some of the holidays that we had to kind of man those buildings so that they could be present to help with any issues to try to be proactive in our efforts to make sure that we're addressing um, so that our 182 didn't wind up being 382 and would be more impactful on the system as we move forward. I got you now if I could I'd like to ask you about the the energy performance uh, comments that you made and um, some of the the energy performance related concepts are uh, replacement of, of, of lighting fixtures and light bulbs for for more effective more efficient uh, illumination in our schools which results in a savings to us now there's a program whereby any savings are returned to the system how does that work in this particular case what we are talking about savings are leverage to make the financing available, financing available to complete the project and to be able to uh, make additional capital improvements. So in this case, we have leveraged those savings, gotten those funds, and in some cases, centrally air conditioned the building, or in a lot of cases, have efficient lighting, boiler modification, control modification, or updating the control from old obsolete style to direct digital controls, providing the capability for providing better environment and uh, saving at the same time. Now, with regard to the replacement of bulbs and things, that occurs even in some of our newer buildings, like Carver, for example. I was in Carver, uh, I want to say a few months ago, and there was a crew working in there to replace bulbs in the, yeah. in the cafeteria, and it's a relatively new school. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, once again, we're trying to find the, the uh, most efficient footprint for Baltimore County, which will ultimately, over the long term, will help us with our energy usage um, demand, which will drive that down, which will be ongoing costs as we move along. Now, there's a couple of terms of art that you use in your, in your summary, one of which is building envelope improvements. Those are improvements inside the four walls of the building. Is that correct? That's correct. And you also make reference to plug load controllers. What is a plug load controller? 
it's just con it's one form of controlling electrical load when you do that it's a technical name for a device that controls electrical load and when you control electrical load you save electrical cost and that's all it is so instead of it mm -hmm. in a single screen that's running all the time we can control peak times and downtime so we can maximize the amount of energy that we supply to our or a built-in cycle that we have to get the maximum efficiency, and that's done through some of the uh, upgrades that we've had, certainly in, in all of our more modern buildings, but some of our older ones with the savings that we're having from our energy performance contracting, we can work on some of our, um, our older facilities to make sure that they have some of the same opportunities relating to that energy efficiency and trying to get the maximum out of our building envelope. Now, directing your attention to the Northeast Area 2 um, uh, school, the new, new elementary school proposed for the Northeast. Um, that's been identified as sort of the Ridge Road. Yes, sir. And that's actually, that would actually be located somewhere between, say, Perry Hall Boulevard and Bel Air Road, south of White Marsh Mall. That's correct. And um, I want to just ask you, um, uh, projecting out, recognizing there are all these other variables out there, at this stage, looking over the horizon, when um, or in terms of phases, um, whatever phase that is in, could you identify it? And secondly, say how long you anticipate that phase lasting? It's, it's too early to project, but our target date is for opening in 2020. Mm -hmm. I see. And that's also anticipated to be another 900-seat elementary school. Seven. Seven, I see. Seats. So we had 900 for Victory Villa. 700. 700 for Victory Villa. We had, um, uh, strike that, we had 700 because we had 900 over at uh, Vincent Farm, which was 200 over. Uh, the 700 are really 699 projection for it. So it's another 700-seat facility for Victory Villa, 700-seat for our Northeast Elementary School, which is going to get named very shortly, and then 700 for the new Northeast Second Elementary School, so it'd be 2,100 um, total seats. But of course it's less because of what the prior capacity would have been for Victory Villa before it was built, uh, before, before it was torn down. Yes, Got it, okay. Now with regard to the Northeast Middle School, um, that's, uh, that, that's moved into the planning stage because of the money that was set aside for planning, is that correct? Correct. And uh, it's been identified as being in the schematic design phase. Could you share for the folks here tonight what schematic design phase means? Which is the earliest stage of design. Um, the three or four different stages of design. Schematic is the concept design. Then we develop design into more detail. After the design is developed, then we prepare final design and construction document. All of this time frame, it is anywhere from 12 to 18 months and it requires state's review at every stage mm -hmm. of the design. So and it's, it's and that, that's, that's one way to make sure that I's have been dotted, T's have been crossed, questions have been asked and answered, and it's a, another way to tighten the relationship with um, state uh, interagency committee on public school um, construction. Is that correct? Yeah, it's their okay. requirement also. I all, gotcha. all while trying to make sure that we are addressing the instructional goals from our um, instructional um, leaders so that we're making sure that the facility meets the needs of programming and instructional needs. Now I noted you'd, you made reference of Essex and Middlesex that we had completed the roof jobs there and that Chesapeake which is underway is currently on schedule. Uh, Orms uh, is slated for completion by December of this year is that correct? I don't have no I don't believe I said that let me make sure. Um, you may have written it. Orms, Herm, Hernwood and Deer Park Middle. Orms is still in the design stage from what mm -hmm. I can re recall. Um, yeah. Our schedule for completion in December 2018. Well, um, as I'm taking a look here, it reads, Orms and Timber Grove Elementary Schools are scheduled for completion in December of 2018. Yes. So that would be the roofing job for Orms, so it would be completed by the end of the year. That's, right. That's at least what the projection is for it right now. You have no reason to believe that it will go beyand 2018. That's the best I know at this time. Okay, well, that's <laughs> the, uh, well we want the best that you know. <laughs> Uh, now, if I might just ask you with regard to Parkville High School, uh, the Parkville High School, that's scheduled for completion in April of next year. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Okay, good. Uh, now, if I might just direct your attention to the Kenwood air conditioning job, you would referenced that that is um, on schedule, it's on a target, and that target is for August of this year. That's correct, the classroom uh, portion of mm -hmm. it. Now, you don't, uh, at the present time, there is nothing visible that would cause you to reassess or reschedule that date for, yeah, for that to be completed. That's the best we know at this time. Construction right. sometimes can be unpredictable. Right, and that's what I wanted to ask you about, because at Gold Ring Middle School, the school has been air-conditioned. It it, it's a fabulous thing that the Gold Ring Middle School, our Gold Ring Middle School, is being air-conditioned. There is a big box inside of that school, and that's, that's the auditorium. And the auditorium has a box that's the size of a suburban Chevrolet that's supposed to be, like, on the roof, on the ceiling, so it's on the inside. It's huge, and it's there. I wanted to ask you, when will that box become operational and that auditorium be air conditioned? I can get back to you on that. That's fair. I was there for a, a magnet uh, showcase and there were a fair number of folks in there. The rest of the school was pretty good. But in the auditorium, you know, we need to get, we need to get that going. Now, directing your attention to um, Overly High School, you made reference of two parking jobs occurring there. Yeah. Phase one has been completed. Yeah. Phase two, student parking, because we have a lot of students that drive. That's, uh, that's still underway. Could you, just, could you just let the folks, could you let us know tonight whether or not that project remains on schedule for completion? It remains on schedule. Our target date is summer of 2018. Now, I do want to ask you about a project that, that harkens back to 1980 when it was first proposed. And if one goes to a certain elementary school in Middle River, and it's dismissal time, and one goes to the street right outside of the school, one can always find our assistant principal because she's standing in the road with a hand-held stop sign. The school is our Orms Elementary School. It's in our sixth district, just like our Golden Ring Middle School is, and just like our Overly uh, High School is. And I wanted to ask you about this project that's been around since 1980. Folks have, have wanted this to happen. And it's a bus loop because, you know, in fact, now with the redistricting, we're going to have additional buses coming to that school. And I wanted to ask you about that project and its projection as an on-site improvement for the school. What is your view tonight as to when that will be ready? We are targeting for summer of this year, 2018. Very good. Gentlemen, thank you ever so much for your patience with these questions. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Stewart. <laughs> uh, thank you, Steve. There was one clap. Uh, I guess I might even be shorter than that somehow. Um, but gentlemen, uh, you mentioned that Delaney High will be moving forward. Is that in part as a result of our February 7th letter and determination by our county executive to fund that project? Um, that's twofold. It's the first part is it's part of our current capital plan. So for us, it's moving forward until someone tells us otherwise. So that's the first part. The decision that was made a week, week and a half ago, that just added clarity as it relates to our planning moving forward with the superintendent. And, and timing. And timing, yes, All sir. Right. So in light of that, uh, I'd like to make a comment. I think the community has a right to know where I stand and eventually where this board stands. Um, I intend to support the replacement of Delaney High in a manner to be decided by our school system, provided the following events occur. That one, the Board of Education has the replacement of Lansdowne High School as an item on our capital plan, including a redesignation of funds. And that also the county executive agrees to fund and deliver the Lansdowne project on a substantially similar timeline, as we just discussed, as the Delaney project. And so I'll add as context to this statement that I will be also asking the board to issue a formal plea to the state for allocations for Delaney and Lansdowne, given their clear support for these new schools from our governor and comptroller and given the support for substantially more dollars for school construction via the lockbox. As to equitable treatment, this should not come as a surprise. For months, the Lansdowne community and this board has been engaged in a difficult but honest conversation about the well-being of our students, about the best way forward given limitations in finances. On February 7th of this year, things changed. Through a letter from our county executive, we have re-stacked 
the deck. The table is reset in a material way that produces an untenable result, and that is the inequitable treatment for a community that may be less affluent and less politically powerful, but no less deserving. To offer some context, a recitation of facts is necessary. In late 2016, early 2017, our county executive treated Lansdowne and Delaney similarly by proposing similar renovations for both schools. This fact made sense as both schools were similarly built around the same time, have poor facilities with Lansdowne being worse, and have similar enrollment needs. In supporting his proposal for renovations, the county executive said there is no money for new schools and that rejecting the renovation meant no new school for 15 or 20 years. Despite this message, in March 2017, Delaney made a choice. They rejected their renovation, and the board agreed to put Delaney at the very end of its capital plan for replacements, where it had chosen to wait for another 15 to 20 years. The county executive at that time cautioned Lansdowne not to do the same thing, because again, there was no money for new schools. So, in a spirit of good faith and collaboration, one that's been mentioned here tonight, Lansdowne worked on expanding the scope of its renovation, believing there was no new money for schools, for new schools. In September 2017, the county executive changed course and said there is money for a new school in the Northeast. However, the placement of that school would be determined independently by the school system, and that's only after a six-month enrollment study that is currently underway at a cost of $200,000, mind you. On February 7th, the county executive short-circuited this process and selected precisely where that new school is going to be placed. It's going to be Delaney. This announcement came five days before the governor was scheduled to visit Delaney. The county executive bases his decision off of 2016 student counts data. His decision came just a week and a half before the 2017 data was released. There is a reason for that. The county executive says we need to alleviate overcrowding in the, quote, central corridor which will need, according to him, a thousand seats in 10 years. He believes this is the most effective and cost-efficient strategy to do it. As is made clear in our 2017 students count data, the central region will need 659 seats in 10 years, not 1,000. The vast majority of these seats are attributable to Towson alone. If you remove Towson from the equation, which is being addressed with a 600 seat addition, well, replacement that will add 600 seats, what we really need to do is provide relief elsewhere, northeast, southeast. To suggest that building a new Delaney High School is the best way to relieve overcrowding in other areas strains credulity. Members of the board, you have maps in front of you tonight, those nice colored diagrams. To relieve Parkville and Perry Hall, you can build a school somewhere near both of them, or you can build a new Delaney High and then do one of two things. You can stretch the boundaries to a preposterous degree or force a major domino effect, shifting Perry Hall students, for example, into Lock Raven and Lock Raven students into Delaney. In any event, however you come out on this decision, the complexity of it speaks to why our county executive originally thought that this should be made after we complete our enrollment study and after we receive recommendations from folks who are not political, not partisan, who are planners, whose jobs are based on results and not votes. Ultimately, our school system did not sign off on the county executive's decision before it was announced, nor did council members who represent the areas. That's why, on February 13th, six of seven council members wrote a letter disagreeing with the county executive's edict. Folks, the bottom line is this. It appears our county executive did not shoot straight with us, with this board, with the Lansdowne community. Yes, I believed in the renovation. It was a great result in a world with no new high schools. However, to the extent that this fundamental premise has changed, to the extent there is suddenly money for new schools, Lansdowne should be treated equitably along with Delaney. Zip codes should not matter. Political importance should not matter. And we should not have to settle for what is unfair and unjust when we are told money is there because the school itself can't last that much longer. What is fair for Delaney is fair for Lansdowne. And I can say this as a board member, as a graduate of Delaney High School, and as a resident of our Southwest community, this is not us versus them. We are all in this together. In supporting you this, this plan, his plan, you heard the county executive say he is simply funding what was placed on the capital plan, disregarding, of course, where the projects actually appear on that plan. In doing so, the county executive made it clear to us that the only way to ensure equitable treatment for these schools is to now have both on the capital plan as new schools. We still need to have a discussion about other areas, 
and our next county executive and our next county council will need to have a discussion about taxes and spending and debt service and pension liabilities and the state lockbox and to be clear, paying for the promises of today. But having Lansdowne on the capital plan as a replacement is the only way it moves forward per our county executive. So that's the essence of the motion to come. It is equality, one of the most important values we have a school system, as a school system. And I hope you will give it consideration when it comes to you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Ms. Causey. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, thank you, Mr. Stewart, for your comments. I just have to say in the opening, welcome, Mr. Stewart, Delegate Ebersall, and Councilman Quirk to advocating for a replacement school to Lansdowne High School. I would like an acknowledgement that there have been members of this board that for over a year, maybe even two, when we go back to the beginning of trying to get equitable air conditioning implemented at a faster rate, that have been advocating for equitable facilities, have been advocating for a 10-year comprehensive strategic plan. So you'll be supporting the motion? I will have to see the motion to support it, and I appreciate you coming to the idea that what this board needs to do is to identify the needs and ask for what we need. But I would like to also respond that there is nothing sudden or unexpected about the announcement that Delaney High School will be and it is the result of thoughtful planning and advocating over the course of many years. Um, as they have been advocating for a comprehensive solution to the conditions since November of 2014, the, uh, as Mr. Stewart pointed out the county executive did propo propose renovating four high schools, Lansdowne, Patapsco, Woodlawn, and Delaney, based on their mechanical, electrical, and plumbing score. Feasibility studies were done and different plans were adopted. It was noted that there uh, is a deficit of space at Delaney High School. So when you talk about the safety concerns, which we've heard a great deal about tonight, that is very much one of the issues that we need to <coughs> focus on when we're talking about renovation or replacement. We have buildings with additions, on additions, on additions, alleys, small hallways, small turns, a number of doors, so that in talking about securing these buildings, it is much more difficult than in constructing a new building, as we have heard tonight, for today's times, for today's issues. So in that, there were different studies that were taking place, and in March, uh, of 2017, there was a proposed renovation for Delaney High School for $36 million. And many people have stated that the Delaney community rejected it. In fact, the Delaney community does not get to vote, just as the Lansdowne community has not been afforded the opportunity to vote. That is the job of the 12 people up here. And we unanimously rejected that inadequate contract for Delaney by not even bringing it forward for a vote. So this board rejected it. At the same time, we also rejected the Lansdowne renovation. That was inadequate. There were many people here that night advocating for equitable facilities around the school system. What was advocated for previously for Lansdowne was a renovation. And a comprehensive renovation is how the board responded to Mr. Quirk. Uh, the, re the renovation proposed for Lansdowne High School is $60 million, the most expensive ever. And there was quite a bit of time and angst from some people trying to convince other members of the board, me included, that that renovation was sufficient. However, Delaney uh, High School still has a current space deficiency. It has projected overcrowding, decrepit infrastructure worse than any other high school in the county, except Lansdowne High School, which was forward funded for its solution that was uh, championed for. Um, in December of 2017, the Baltimore County Board of Education voted unanimously to add Towson High School and Delaney High School to the fiscal year 2019 capital request. That's based on severe overcrowding that's happening at Towson and the deficit of space and the deficit of the mechanical, electrical, uh, and plumbing, but also the fact that Delaney High School at that time is the only school that's the one school that did not have a plan. In the recent projections that we just received, it stated that the Towson High School 
overcrowding will be even higher than was previously noted, while Delaney's overcrowding, while still there, is slightly less than it was indicated before. And thank you for having the maps, because as you can see, Towson in this small area and Delaney in this larger catchment area and with a larger site of 43 acres is part of the solution for the Towson overcrowding. So for many reasons, it is appropriate that Delaney receive the planning money in conjunction with Towson to relieve the overcrowding that's not just coming, but it's already here. It should not be that one community has to receive something at the detriment of another. Lansdowne High School should have been on the replacement list a year ago. Uh, when we were advocating at the same time for Delaney. And the fact is, is now that it, the time has been taken up and it is time that has gone under the bridge. And I'm looking forward to discussions of how we can make things better for Lansdowne, but not slowing down the progress that still needs to be made in other communities. Um, and I also hope that this board now will seriously consider a 10-year strategic plan, not something theoretical, but something specific that's already successful, and that's been the Anne Arundel County Public School Strategic Plan, so successful that it's been uh, hearkened by the Interagency Committee on School Construction, that it should be a model for the state, and they're in their second decade of implementation. But it requires the working together of the county council, the county executive, the board of education, and also the superintendent. So we need to have some serious conversations about how that can start and when that should start to be most effective for the schools throughout the system. Because these needs are not all of the needs. As we heard from uh, our advocate um, for District 6, Lily Rowe, there are some schools with significant overcrowding that are not even in the discussion yet. So when we're talking about how are we going to equitably provide for each of our students a safe and healthy learning environment? We need to talk about the system as a whole objectively with criteria that we can all agree to are important. So I do look forward to additional discussions because there is more that can and should be done. Are there other questions or comments? Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Uh, I have some questions, but first I, I also wanted to make a statement with regard to Delaney and Lansdowne. Uh, and, and I too want to welcome Councilman Quirk and Delegate Eversall and Nick Stewart. Welcome to the fold. Better late than never. I would have liked to have heard our elected representatives acknowledge the generosity of the advocates who were sitting behind them who applauded your newfound enlightenment regarding Lansdowne. Nothing has changed over the past year and a half. Lansdowne has always been in dire need of a new school, along with Delaney and Taos. What changed with it was the county executive's actions, which appear to differ from correct <coughs> processes. When funding decisions are based on political expediency rather than system need, then it can change on a whim. A well thought out 10 year facilities plan like Ms. Causey and others have been advocating for would change based only on need. So I hope our enlightened representatives will not only make public statements and wear t-shirts, <coughs> but will help be part of the solution in doing what is right and getting a new school for Lansdowne without pitting schools against one another. This board needs to consider the opportunity cost of STAT as it impacts every aspect of our school system, including facilities. And I hope that we can all take this as an instructive moment. Uh, I did have a few questions. Um, uh, some stakeholders have raised uh, the issue about the lack of using bleach to sterilize the schools. So you know, while we're all suffering from the flu, I thought it would be a good time to ask, do we use bleach? And um, if not, could we use it when we do the extensive summer cleaning? The chemicals we use are the ones that are certified by EPA. And 
bleach is only used when it is absolutely necessary to do that. Otherwise, we discourage the use of that. That's based on a host of different factors. We have a lot of students and staff with uh, a host of allergenic reactions, and we just have to be careful that we're not, um, in our effort to um, clean the environment, we actually make it more harmful than what it was before. So we're, we certainly understand that bleach has been something that I think we all kind of grew up on, but um, some of the um, issues that we're having with different types of allergies have just progressed over the years, and we just wanted to make sure that we're following the guidelines that our um, yeah, EPA and the other agencies that we use for that. Well, well, I, I appreciate that response. I'm the mother of two children who were allergic to their elementary school. Um, so I, I would just ask that maybe you consider it for that summer cleaning. Yes, ma'am. Um, you talked about the security initiative, uh, and, and I might have missed some of it as far as, could, could you detail that a little bit more? The elementary projects were completed in 2016. That included um, primarily um, additional cameras throughout the footprint of the building and some of the external, as well as door accesses for, and, and in some cases it may be additional door accesses, so we may have had some. Our, our security initiative is it's not a one and done. It's, it's always evolving. So this, this allocation here for elementary was to further our footprint related to more cameras and door accesses. The middle school projects were completed in 2017, which further expanded more cameras and door accesses at the middle school level to, to continue our efforts to make sure that our buildings are the safest possible. And Mr. Dixit is completing now the phase for high school that will be completed sometime in 2018 um, as we get those projects done. With the only caveat being schools that are under renovation, we're not gonna do those until we get closer to finishing the renovation so that we don't tear up some of the work of the uh, uh, security initiative, so it's, it's done as a phase of that uh, addition or renovation or in some cases a replacement. Okay. Um, are there any plans in the works to air condition those schools with partial AC? I know, you know, we made lots of progress in, in getting That is certainly any. our conversation with our funding agencies and working through the superintendent that once we get the remaining projects that we have done, we're, we're already having conversations about there are other areas which we presented to this board several months back about where those areas were so that we can address that as we move along as part of future capital plans when we, as working with the county executive and their team. Yeah, because I believe there were just about as many classrooms un air conditioned in those schools as there were in the schools that had no air conditioning at all. So it represented a, a quite a few classrooms. Um, some, some, okay. And you mentioned that there will be one school that will not have air conditioning by 2022. Which school is that? Delaney High School. Delaney, okay. Um, now, there, it was mentioned during um, public input, uh, one of the stakeholders mentioned how uh, their hope is that, I think it was Glenn Gilhar, that um, Lansdowne, if, if it ever came to pass that we got a new school for Lansdowne, mm -hmm. that the replacement could be built on that site. Um, have there been any feasibility studies to determine whether that site at Lansdowne could support a new school? No feasibility study has been done. Not no. at this time. Okay, so there's no way to know whether the soil would or would not. We can't. No way to determine definitively that the project is is uh, um, eligible for replacement. We have to go through our process in order to do so, if that's this board's direction. How long would such a study take to complete? Um, it's difficult to put a time frame, but uh, six months to eight, 12 months is a reasonable time. But, but that's, well, however, that's contingent upon the funding. funding. And we have capital cycles that run. We're in the process of one now that is 75% funded from the state level, which by sometime in early March, 
the will be at the 90 percent level. So we're already underway in the capital plan that we're in now, the FY19 um, capital plan that we're in now. So it depends on where it will land on the capital plan as it relates to when funding is made available to do that work. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. McDaniels. Thank you. Uh, just to comment, I um, just wanted to add that I am uh, a bit unsettled, too, about the pathway that we seem to be following now with our high school uh, renovations and replacements. Um, as an individual board member, I uh, would have to say I have supported the renovation at Lansdowne all along. Um, and one of the main reasons was because I thought it matched the fiscal reality that we were in. Um, it's quite easy to take a position as a board member that once a school gets 50 or 60 years old that the right thing to do is just replace it, but you can quickly see that we get into the half a billion dollar category just in Baltimore County. And when I, for what I thought were the available funds from the state and the county, the replacement pathway seemed to make sense at the time that I voted on it. But the recent announcement that um, there is now a plan to replace Delaney High School uh, after recently deciding as a board that we would renovate Lansdowne at a time where we looked at these four high schools doesn't seem like an equitable decision to me. Um, I am not completely aware of what criteria the county executive used completely to come up with this decision, but I, like my fellow board members, certainly think that we need to understand what objective criteria we are using to decide to build a new school. And at this time, I don't know what those objective criteria are. I also was looking for the results of this high school study that we've spent a couple hundred thousand dollars to do so that we could move in that direction to objectively uh, make these decisions. Um, but just uh, in the near term, having decided to renovate the school that was rated worse from the MEP study, uh, and then just a few months later decide to uh, build another school, uh, just uh, makes me very uncomfortable. Um, and uh, it will be interesting to see how this board can move forward in a more objective um, way of doing business. Any other comments before we move on? Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. McDaniels, for your comments. I think what you bring up is some very important issues, which is the amount of information that's given to the board to support these very important, very impactful choices that we have to make for our constituents. And I agree that there is not enough given to us early enough to consider in terms of making the best decisions, especially in light of all of the needs in all of our areas, elementary, middle, and high school. Um, so I think that maybe that's something where board members that are concerned about the decisions that we have to make ask for information and that we receive it in a timely way and have enough time to discuss those in order for all of us to come to uh, a good decision for each of our schools, for each of our areas. Um, and that le leads me to a specific question um, that uh, Mrs. Hen had discussed with me, which is in going over the state rated capacities um, and the um, projections, it is projected consistently that Western Technology, uh, Carver Arts, Kenwood, um, excuse me, and Eastern Tech are dedicated magnet schools um, are consistently under capacity. And yet we understand um, that they have waiting lists. Um, so I'm curious, what is the system's decision to hold enrollment when there is capacity? And we do have overcrowding in all the surrounding areas, so that could be one way to, I mean, it is small, it's uh, 99 seats available, um, Western Technologies, um, 100 seats available, and Eastern Tech is 160, 163 seats available. But given the immense overcrowding that we have, what is the system's reasoning for holding that consistently under capacity? So again, I, and thank you, Ms. Causey, for your question. I do think it is a complex issue. It's not just an issue of capacity when it comes to our comprehensive magnet school.
know, they offer specialized programs that require teachers in, spe in those specialized programs with um, an advanced level of knowledge um, to teach those courses. So many times it's a staffing issue, many times it's uh, that programmatic issue as well. And so it's not just a capacity issue when it comes to our comprehensive mag. Well, is it, we understood from community members that came forward talking about Carver Arts losing a very particular talented um, dance teacher, um, and they were saying it was an issue of staffing. So is that where we need to make the priority to fund more staffing in order to utilize those very popular and effective programs? I think it's apples and oranges. Again, you're talking about um, a recruitment issue. You're talking about specialized areas of certification. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I thank Mr. Smith and Mr. Dixit for that presentation. I think we have had a good discussion and um, we will continue that discussion. Next on our agenda is item J. Mr. Hayden. Just back to the issue that it looks Don't like leave yet, Mr. Smith. Um, to me, uh, I, I, I take this back to a very simple position in saying what we should do. What is the right thing to do? Does it make sense to... Turn on your mic. Does it make sense to build a building that's really not what we want, but it'll get us through? And at some point in time, it'll be a waste? I mean, we have examples of waste all around us uh, uh, in the county, in the state, in the nation, where people have made that decision to say, well, let's go ahead and do it. It's only X millions of dollars. Why don't we do the right thing? And if we have to be innovative and smart about how we plan our money, how we schedule our money out, let's do something like that rather than saying, oh, there's no way it can be done. Let's, do, let's build a partial here and a partial there. And a few years down the road, everybody says, why in the world did they do that? I don't want to be in a position of having somebody look at me and saying, why did you guys do that? And we have to be careful that we're not walking down that path right now, and I think in some instances we are. So I, I caution my fellow board members on that. Thank you, Mr. Hayden. Thank you, Mr. Smith and Mr. Dixit. Next on our agenda is item J, a work session report on transportation. Um, Mr. McRae is going to come up. I think Mr. Smith is going to stay up. So, uh, Mr. Uh, um, Mr. Chair, as the team comes up, I just, again, again good evening to everyone. Uh, and again, you have um, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Smith, and Mr. McRae who will give the report tonight. I'd like to update the board and the public on topics that I believe are very much related to the transportation report that you're going to receive tonight. Um, tonight, you'll, you're going to learn about the data that's related to our enormous fleet. Um, and again, hats off not only to our facilities team, but to our transportation team as well, uh, transporting uh, so many children on every single day, making sure that they get to their safe destination. So thanks to our team. You'll also learn about their human dynamics related to transportation, which is why we have the school aspect in the report tonight as well. My team and I have also um, are also looking at other topics that are tangential to transportation, in my estimation, that will be explored as we move forward. To that end, this board and the, as well as the public, we've had uh, conversations about school start times. We've had conversations about examining a longer school day. Uh, we also know that we have the progression of our progr programs in terms of um, as kids matriculate forward, they have various programmatic needs, such as uh, second language acquisition and the infusion of additional um, CTE and magnet programs as well that may have an impact not only on transportation, which will be related to this issue tonight, but also on our secondary school schedules. So therefore, I've asked our team to uh, uh, form a task force to examine these topics, not in isolation, but as a collective programmatic block to get a systemic view of how one will affect the other. So this will include, uh, will provide us with an opportunity to um, not only work with our collective bar bargaining agencies, again, we know that each of these topics, we have to make sure that we're getting the voices of uh, all of our collective bargaining agencies, and they're all related. Uh, we're also, uh, this will also give us an opportunity to 
monitor the effectiveness of our current, not only high school, but current middle and high school schedules. Um, so as they relate to systemic programming um, for all of our students to determine if adjustments are needed um, to be made. So as the task force uh, can, um, gets developed and does its work, we will be providing regular updates uh, to the board as well and to the public. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it over to our most capable team. There you go. Chairman Gillis, Ms. White, members of the board, it is our pleasure to be presenting to you today. I'm joined by Mr. George Roberts, Mr. Um, David McCray, that we will pr provide to you an update or report on our transportation. Um, this report is a report of listening to what the concerns are and trying to put together systemic data that will drive our decisions. Once again, some of the data that you will see here is being built. We're building that data. Some of this is baseline, but we're excited about where we are and we're excited about where we're headed. Um, this presentation that you have here will uh, highlight some of the data points that you've asked us to look at, as well as to introduce some of the data points that we look at on a daily, weekly, monthly basis as we evaluate this school system as it relates to delivering transportation services all while doing it from the most safe standpoint as possible. Our three key factors that you're gonna hear from Mr. McRae and Mr. Roberts are safety, efficiency, and service. That's what we do in transportation. However, you have to realize that the system that we have is a massive system and we need to hear all of the concerns that we have and opportunities that we can in order to improve our system. However, it is not one that can be that can be fixed overnight. It takes, we have to put systems in place that we can um, run with, longe with longevity and fidelity. So that's why we're here today. Um, with that being said, I will turn it over to Mr. McRae and Mr. Roberts and we'll be available at the end to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thanks. Um, can we presentation? Well, good evening, Chairman Gillis, um, Ms. White, and Mr. Stewart, and distinguished board members. Um, those elements that Kevin talked about, safety, efficiency, and service, are actually the essence of the mission statement of the Office of Transportation. And this mission statement was developed um, by staff many, many years ago, um, and those three areas remain our emphasis, and therefore the focus of the data that you'll see tonight as well as what we strive to deliver every, each and every day um, that we operate. Before going into any data and metrics in, in more detail, I do want to give you a flavour for the scale and the size and the scope of the operation that Kevin um, mentioned earlier. 25th largest district owned school bus fleet in the United States. Um, we maintain, we currently maintain 856 of our own buses on 11 bus lots and we transport over 81,000 students daily, travelling 73,520 miles each day, and that's in excess of 13 million annually. Currently, 80, 827 daily routes, and 621 of those are general education routes, and 260, oh, sorry, 206 special education routes. And we have three full service maintenance facilities uh, in our operation. Office of Transportation currently employs over a thousand bus drivers, attendants and technicians. Those individuals are assigned to one of our 11 bus lots or maintenance facilities located throughout Baltimore County's 610 square miles, from the PA line in the north and to Anne Arundel County in the south. And it's no mean feat to make this entire operation tick on a daily basis. With that overview and our stated mission of safety, efficiency and service, to frame the conversation, we can now look at individual data and performance metrics that are most critical to our students. <laughs> safety. The safety of our students, staff and the motoring public is our primary focus in the Office of Transportation. It's the how and why we do all that we do. It's the gauge against which we measure and assess every initiative, every task, Every request, it's the guidepost we use in establishing our service, creating bus stops, purchasing equipment, hiring and training of personnel. 
Providing a safe and secure environment for our students is a shared commitment. And the Office of Transportation works in partnership with our schools and school administrators to make a, a, this a reality. Before we look at specific data points, Mr George Roberts, our Zone 2 Community Superintendent, will discuss the collaboration with our schools. Thank you, Mr McCray. So how students are greeted as they enter the bus every day, coupled with established school climate by bus drivers and school administrators, is absolutely critical to a student's readiness as they start the school day. Schools take explicit steps to ensure that the safety and well-being of all students who are transported to and from BCPS are taken very seriously every day. Bus evacuation drills are mandatory for all students at the beginning of the school year in the unlikely event that students are unable to enter the bus under normal conditions. So equally important, the building of a strong school to bus driver connection and student expectations established at the beginning of every year play a critical role in maintaining a safe and orderly environment on the bus. However, when infractions occur, and they do occur related to transportation, clear and deliberate measures are available to bus drivers and school administration to address the poor student choices. School administrators review the student handbook at the beginning of every school year, and students are informed that the scope of the student handbook extends door to door, from when they're picked up to when they're dropped off, and then when they get on the bus in the afternoon to when they're delivered to home. When a bus driver witnesses an infraction, he or she can report the incident to the school's administration, who will then conduct a full investigation of the alleged incident. If necessary, issue logical consequences based on the student handbook, including, but not limited to, bus referrals, student conference, parent conferences, detention, and bus suspensions. The same process occurs even when students, parents, or community members report bus infractions or student infractions on the bus. The Office of Transportation and Schools take bus safety very seriously and work together every day to ensure a safe bus ride to and from school. Mr. McCray will now share more information related to transportation safety efforts and initiatives. As the 25th largest publicly owned school bus operation in the country, BCPS has made a, a huge investment in fleet, fleet vehicles. Um, these vehicles are kept in safe running order by a dedicated team of technicians and service workers, some of whom are with us this evening. The men and women who are responsible for the maintenance of our bus fleet are in many ways the unsung heroes of the operation. In fact, the Office of Transportation has never recorded a school bus accident that was ascribed to a mechanical defect or a breakdown. Keeping our school buses well maintained and fully compliant with the Motor Vehicle Administration and Maryland State Department of Education procedures is hugely important to the safety of our students. Maintaining adequate technician to vehicle ratios is critical to keeping safe buses on the road and minimising the need for outside contractual repair services. And we've recently enhanced our maintenance operation by adding technicians and therefore thereby improving technician to vehicle ratios. Additionally, we've increased our support staff, including shop supervisors and body paint technicians. Professional development. And this slide uh, details um, BCPS pre-service training hours as well as uh, Comar mandated annual in-service training that drivers and attendants take each year. And our three new training positions will be introduced during phase three of the Officer Transportation Realignment Plan and this will help to facilitate growth in all aspects of training delivery moving forwards. It should go without saying that our accident exposure and experience is something we take terribly seriously. Obviously, providing a safe and secure environment for our students depends heavily on the men and women who dedicate themselves to driving our precious cargo. The first and most obvious way that we measure effectiveness of our safety programmes is through accident statistics. And as we look at the statistics, it's important to define our terms. In BCPS and throughout Maryland, accidents are defined in COMAR as an occurrence or action involving a driver of a school vehicle operated by or under contract to a local school system, which results in an injury or a fatality to an individual or damage to a motor vehicle or property. Any time we have property damage or injury, we have an accident. If two buses clip mirrors, we record an accident. If a driver dents a bumper while parking, we record an accident. And we're scrupulous about recording and reporting the most minor of mishaps. If it's a $25 repair, we still record it as an accident. 
The total number of school bus accident in each of the past three years are reflected in the chart, and you'll note that the accidents are categorised as preventable and non-preventable. And preventability is a standard defined by the Maryland State Department of Education. A determination of preventability means that even when the driver is not legally or primarily responsible, the school bus driver must do everything that can be reasonably done to prevent the accident. And that means that we enforce a standard that's even stricter than the legal standard of who's at fault. Each month, every school bus accident is reviewed by the Office of Transportation Accident Review Committee to determine if the accident was preventable on our driver's part. And the Accident Review Committee is comprised of 10 bus drivers, a senior operations supervisor, driver trainer, and one Baltimore County police officer. School bus drivers who have two or more preventable accidents involving injury or appreciable damage um, in a 24-month period lose their certification to operate a school bus in the state of Maryland. Regardless of severity, any driver whose accident is deemed to be preventable is required to attend a retraining class. National statistics consist consistently show that school bus transportation is the very safest form of ground transportation. Those national statistics are borne out in BCPS as well. In the last three school years, looking at all of our accidents, on average, less than 1% involve student injury. A driver's ability to safely operate that 17,000-pound vehicle has an obvious and direct impact on our student safety. Less obvious, perhaps, but no less direct is the impact of the driver's ability to manage human behaviour. The school bus is in many ways a classroom on wheels, except that the person in charge to manage our students has our back turned towards those students. In the Office of Transportation, we spend many hours training drivers to be able to obtain a commercial driver's licence, training them in pre- and post-trip inspections, training them in first aid, training them in defensive driving practices, but equally important to the safe operation of a school bus is student behaviour. And as you heard earlier from Mr Roberts, our success in that regard is a direct result of the strong partnerships we have with schools and school administrators. Service. As we shared earlier in our presentation, the Office of Transportation currently operates 827 daily routes, and those routes support a variety of educational programmes. The bulk of our routes, over 75%, serve students in general education programs, and they operate within well-defined geographic boundaries. They're typically tiered to allow each driver to serve multiple schools, typically a high school, a middle school, and two or sometimes three elementary schools, depending on bell schedules and geography. The remaining 25% of our routes may serve students from one or more special programs, including special needs programs, magnet programs, and ESOL programs. The special needs buses serve some of our most fragile students on a daily basis, and our drivers, do, drivers and attendants do so with a high level of professionalism and coordination with school-based staff. Now, these routes are designed to support students' IEPs, and typically, but not always, are set up as door-to-door -door service. Our magnet and ESOL routes cover a much broader geographical area than our general education routes, and rather than community bus stops, these students are transported from their home schools or from sometimes assigned satellite schools. One of our most challenging areas of service, supports, of service delivery supports our population of displaced students. The McKinney-Vento Act ensures educational rights and protections for children and youth experiencing homelessness, and that school districts must provide transportation to the school of origin upon request of a parent or guardian, even if the school of origin is in another school district. Our ongoing challenge and commitment is to have bus service in place within five days of receiving notice of a displaced student's eligibility for service. Partnerships enhancing our service. I mentioned earlier that our, our special needs routes serve some of our most fragile students, fragile physically and in some cases fragile emotionally. Providing a safe and secure environment for these students means that we provide service that is highly individualised. We provide individual bus stops, special adaptive equipment, and if the IEP calls for it, at least one attendant on every bus. Our special needs pr programmes are not established with the same kind of boundary parameters as we see in the general education programme. 
And the result can be that some of our most fragile children are transported over long distances to get to the programme that meets their individual needs. Because of this, nowhere are our partnerships more critical than when they support our special needs students. To that end, the Office of Transportation recently added a position of special education liaison to support and reinforce the importance of these partnerships. And also in our budget request for school year 19, um, we're including um, a request for additional 15 additional bus attendants. In addition, we've recently partnered with the Department of Health Services, um, something which Superintendent White has spoken about, to provide youth mental health training opportunity for drivers and attendants. And, uh, They've, they've really enjoyed doing that. So service is at the heart of education. As educators, our mission is to serve students, parents of the greater Baltimore County region. Relationships between school staff and bus drivers is a critical component to safe, orderly, and effective day-to-day -day transportation of our students. Schools take pride in building these strong relationships with transportation staff from day one. At the beginning of every school year, schools across the county host opening year bus driver activities, including breakfast meetings or other types of meetings, to not only welcome the drivers, but to share expectations and get to know the drivers and build those relationships. These meetings provide an opportunity for school leadership to greet drivers and transportation staff to share those expectations, but more specifically, bus behaviors and expected bus behaviors from the school to the students. And because we know that bus drivers are the first and last face of over 81,000 students that they see every day, it's important for students to understand that bus drivers are part of Team BCPS and part of their respective schools. But the Office of Transportation does more than safely and efficiently transport students to and from school. Transportation staff partners with high school career and technology staff, specifically in the area of automotive technology, to provide opportunities for students to learn more about bus fleet maintenance and related career opportunities. Future goals of this partnership include internship opportunities for students in our maintenance lots with certified mechanics and professionals to provide our students further opportunity to graduate with industry certifications and ready for the work world. This is one of the many examples of how schools in the Office of Transportation build even stronger connections for the benefit of our students. Mr. McCray will continue with sharing service-oriented data points and other related information. 96% on-time arrivals in the AM. We've talked about the size and scope of our operation. We've talked about the different types of route design. We've talked about tiered routes. But the reality is we can design routes that are efficient, maximizing students served and minimizing miles covered. But if we're not getting our students to school on time, we're not providing optimal service. This is critical in a mission-driven organization where we, we're emphasizing service. In school year 17, our buses met an on-time schedule 96% of the time when we measure in the AM arrivals. To get a sense of the scope of those numbers, Officer Transportation operates the 827 daily routes that I spoke to. With the tiered structure that allows each driver to serve multiple schools, that means our buses may be operating more than 2,000 individual school trips each morning. In 96% of those 2,000 trips, we arrived on time. And this is consistent with our experience in school year 15 and 16. The single biggest obstacle to providing safe, efficient, on-time service for our students, our schools and our parents is a continuing driver shortage. This is an issue that plagues the student transportation industry throughout Maryland and throughout the country, and it has done for many years. The industry-wide shortage of school bus drivers is ongoing, and the reasons behind it are varied. Our numbers reflect the continuing challenge of drivers retiring, separating for other types of employment, or failing to maintain the physical requirements for the job. The Office of Transportation works very closely with the Department of Human Resources in our joint effort to attract, recruit, and, and retain the men and women who are charged with the safe transportation of our students. As you can see from this slide, recruitment and retention are on our agendas all the time. In our efforts to recruit bus drivers and attendants, the Office of Transportation 
as I mentioned, partners with the Department of Human Resources. And we schedule recruitment events at least on a monthly basis. And you can see a list of them in this school year. Um, these events take place in a variety of locations throughout the metropolitan area, including recruitment centre venues, CCBC facilities, local libraries and our own school facilities. As I stated earlier, having the right person, the most qualified person in the driver's seat um, is critically important to student safety. And because it's so important, hiring a school bus driver is a time-consuming process. And given the technical requirements for a school bus driver, the recruitment session to the driving the full-time route can take several months. But by the time the driver is on board and serving students, he or she has received at least 40 hours of pre-service classroom instruction and some 20 hours of behind-the-wheel instruction as required. And it should be noted in our efforts to address our driver shortage, uh, BCPS last year implemented um, a salary upgrade of an average of 1.2% to drivers. Customer service, our, our call centre volume. As mentioned earlier, one aspect of our service delivery is our on-time experience, um, but that's just one metric. In order to get a broader picture, we look at our customer service contacts and responses. And the data depicted in this chart shows the volume of calls made to our call centre inquiry line for the first five weeks of the school year. And the Office of Transportation has implemented a process to record and track the number of types of customer service requests we receive through a call lock. Uh, a review of the weekly summary reflects not only the volume of service calls that come into us during the opening of a new school year, but it also gives a quick picture of how long it takes to resolve issues and achieve a more stable operational mode. The first two weeks of school are normally our peak call time. Because it's a new school year, many of our parents and administrators are calling for information on the new bus routes. What time will the bus arrive? What's my child's bus number? What side of the street will my child be picked up on? During the first week of this year, a total of 3,239 calls came into the central office call line at Pulaski Park. And by the third week of the school year, that number was reduced by over 90%. And on average, our ongoing call experience st stands at approximately 250 calls per week. Because this is a newly implemented system, the chart reflects baseline data that you see there. And in future, with enhanced technology, we'll be able to do year upon year comparisons as well. Efficiency. Producing results you want without waste. Uh, let's look as, at efficiency as it impacts our students first. As mentioned earlier, with 81,000 students riding buses to and from school every day, efficient coordination of transportation and school communication around bus routes and pick up and drop off times is as important to every student who rides the bus. Safe, daily, efficient, and on-time bus service is a critical component to each child's education. This level of efficient service allows students to fully engage in bell-to-bell -bell instruction first thing every morning and allows teachers to engage in every component of the lesson with every student. To support these goals, transportation and school officials work tirelessly over the summer to ensure that the routes are as accurate as possible with safety and efficiency as constant goals. During the opening weeks of school, school administration liaison between transportation officials and parents to answer questions, address concerns, and recommend solutions to ensure our goal of a safe and efficient pickup and delivery of students to and from school every day. Just as a number of factors contribute to the safety of our operation and the service levels we provide, so too a variety of components contribute to the efficiency of any school bus operation. Route design, bell schedules, Minimizing our deadhead mileage, that's between routes. Clear standards for ridership eligibility. And our ability to monitor and assess the efficiency of our overall operation has been greatly enhanced by the introduction of automated routing. This initiative was implemented for our general education routes in school year 16. And in the current school year, we're beginning to expand to include our special needs routes. As mentioned previously, the number of special needs routes is approximately 25% of our total number of daily routes. And the routing process for these programs is very different because of the individualized nature of the service 
and the broader geographic regions covered. Being able to apply the power of electronic writing to our special needs routes will allow us to examine and analyse writing patterns and efficiencies in ways that are not feasible when using manual writing techniques. In addition, this year, we've introduced automated vehicle location, AVL, as we call it. With AVL, we know where each and every bus is every minute that it's operational. We have that information in real time and we have that information recorded. So AVL allows enhanced customer support and really provides us with the opportunity to establish many more detailed metrics than we previously reported using manual data gathering. For example, on-time arrivals and ride-time data will allow us to create more efficient routes. GPS-based reporting of information will give our areas and our special needs teams new potential to increase optimization of our services. Automation is an ongoing process and we'll continue to utilize these systems to improve the efficiency of our services. Eligible ridership. Establish, establishing an efficient routing network begins with establishing baseline eligibility for student transportation services. And transportation services provided for elementary and middle school students who must walk more than one mile to their assigned school, and for high school students who must walk more than 1.5 miles to their assigned school. In BCPS, those standards are set and identified in superintendent's policy in Rule 3410. And as you're aware, one area that came under this has come under recent scrutiny as a stipulation that students use the same bus stop Monday through Friday. While there are safety considerations that underlie this standard, there's also implications for efficiency. We currently have more than 81,000 students eligible to ride school buses. We allot them one seat in a bus. Implementing a system where students can be assigned to more than one seat requires more seats to be available, and ultimately more buses, more staff, and more routes. But while, while Rule 3410 is an issue of efficiency from the transportation perspective, it's simply a matter of safety from the school perspective. Managing different bus rosters on different days of the week, managing changing schedules on a day-to-day -day basis, particularly in large elementary schools, significantly increases the risk of students being misplaced on the wrong bus. Some data points uh, used in the analysis of officer transportation efficiency include the number of daily routes it takes to transport eligible students. And the number of students eligible for transportation increased by approximately 11% between school year 16 and 17, and has reached over 81,000 for school year 18. Another measure of efficiency is related to the size and the maintenance of our school bus fleet. Our fleet size is determined by the number of buses needed relative to the number of eligible riders and the number of spare buses required to maintain a seamless operation. By law, school buses in the state of Maryland have a 12-year life cycle. From a budget planning perspective, ideally the number of buses in the fleet would be distributed evenly over a 12-year life cycle. In other words, if we had a fleet of 600 buses, we should be replacing or purchasing and replacing 50 each year. In reality, the vehicle replacement cycle will be driven by our operational history and by the spending authority set by the county budget office. One of the metrics we consider for fleet efficiency is the cost associated with maintaining our fleet. Um, bus maintenance costs for 2017 are shown here and are broken down into the categories as shown above. The two largest expenditures, as you can see, are salaries and parts. And parts expenditures are impacted by the wide range of bus types in our fleet and also the configurations of those buses. <coughs> it's worth repeating that the faces you see in this slide are the first and last ones seen by almost three quarters of our students in Baltimore County Public Schools. It's through the work and the dedication of these individuals you see on this slide and others behind the scenes that were able to meet the mission of the Office of Transportation and provide safe and efficient school transportation services. And as a former teacher, principal, and current supervisor of schools, I clearly understand and my colleagues understand the importance of strong relationships between schools 
and the staff in the Office of Transportation. So as teachers and staff in our schools continue to receive training on restorative practices and other positive behavior intervention supports, plans are underway for bus drivers to also receive training on relationship building with students and all stakeholders to better support the overall transportation experience of our students. Thank you. As you can see, in an effort of this superintendent to be more transparent, this is a long report, but this is what we do in transporting students. This is a fraction of what we do. I wish it was just pull up to the stop, put a kid on it, take it to school. It's not. It's not. If our drivers have two accidents where they knock two mirrors off, they're done. I gotta let them go. I don't want to, but I gotta let them go. Please understand, we want to transport our students' safety. We want to be on time every single time. But guess what? It is a large system, and there are a lot of factors that we don't control. We have almost 900,000 citizens that drive on these roads every single day. We're only responsible for the 827. These men and women that do this work every day, they hear your concerns, they know your calls, they get those calls. That's why we created a call center, to address those issues. We need your continued support as we do this work together to be transparent, to show our citizens, our students, that we're providing the very best for them. Our goal, this superintendent's goal, this board's goal is to have the premier school transportation system in the country. It takes time and a lot of support and a lot of collaboration that's happening from the instructional side as well as the operational side. We have a very short video. I know you went through a lot, but this is our opportunity to mm -hmm. show the public what we do every day to support our wonderful 113,000 students and the 81 that we transport daily multiple times. safely and on time. They operate 856 buses that travel over 73,000 miles each day and originate from 11 bus facilities around the county. In addition, they are one of our key stakeholders within the school building. The Office of Transportation's mission is really to enhance the experience that our students have on the bus. And that overall operation that we have uh, is from our drivers and attendants uh, right through to our maintenance crew and teams behind the scenes in the office, for example, our writing teams. Um, we're all focused upon uh, making sure that that experience is great for our kids. When our BCPS students ride the school bus, it is an extension of the classroom. Their bus driver is the first and last person that our students encounter. You're welcome. I'm excited. Bye. See ya. Our BCPS bus drivers truly make a difference when they build that personal relationship with the students at BCPS. My bus driver, she, it's one of, she's up there one of the best bus drivers I've ever had. <laughs> you know, back in elementary school, I've had some really great bus drivers, and she's a part of that list. You know, she, she does have some strict rules, but you know, you kind of do understand it. it's for your safety. My bus driver is like really nice and in the morning she will play really loud music to cheer us up and I think it's a really great way to start the morning. And whenever we're feeling down or sad, she would talk to us about her experience about how to deal with these situations so just to cheer us up a bit. I've been a bus attendant for 10 years and I love my job. So I get to spend a few hours out of the day spending time with the kids and getting to hear about their day. And sometimes I even get to help them with their homework. And they get to tell me when they come back on the bus from school, they get to tell me how their day went, whether it was a great day and they're so excited about hearing about it, or even if they didn't have such a great day, they tell me what happened and hopefully I get to help them. Good morning. I love my job and doing it for 18 years. I love driving and I love the kids. I love to interact with the kids. And I try to make them feel comfortable and uh, they listen well and that makes my job so much easier. The relationship with the Office of Special Education is, is a key one for our operation. 
uh, and the partnership that we've created this year with CCAC and will continue to grow is really beginning to enhance the services for our special education students. Um, and they are a, a group that we really want to focus on to improve services as we move forwards. These bus drivers in our school system are truly our unsung heroes because they really help set the stage for our students having a successful learning opportunity. So the partnership between transportation and schools is a very critical one. We know that when students get on the bus and the bus drivers greet them, that that sets a tone. It sets a learning environment on that bus for the child. So the climate that the child experiences on the bus will carry into the school day, but also because it provides an opportunity for our children to develop a positive relationship with another adult in their lives. And that's the relationship we want to build and continue to have with the Department of Transportation in our schools. So Mr. Chair, I just would like to not only thank this team um, for their report, but I also would like to thank uh, members of our Office of Transportation and the, all the bu wonderful bus drivers who transport our students every day. And I would like to ask if we have members of our transportation team and our bus drivers in the audience, if they would please stand to be recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's our report. Very good. Well, Mr. Roberts and Mr. McRae, you're very photogenic on television. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Smith, they made a wise decision. I think so, too. I think so, uh, too. <laughs> I do think so. It's, uh, it's time for questions. I know that Mr. Uh, Virch has already signaled that he has some questions, and I bet that there's others around the room. Mrs. Mrs. Causey has also raised her hand. Mr. Virch. Uh, thank you, Ed. Thank you, gentlemen. And, uh, and again, I, would, I was applauding because, you know, I appreciate very much everything that our drivers do. And really, as has been mentioned earlier, our, our buses really are extensions of our school buildings. Um, I did want to ask you a few questions, if I could. Um, um, Julie Hen and I, both residents of, the, middle, of the, the, the Perry Hall area, we've had a number of questions. I know any time I've received a question from a parent about a route or something that may have occurred on a bus, I haven't hesitated to email uh, Mr. McRae, and uh, soon enough, I either have a response from you or someone from your very uh, responsive office. To the extent Julie Hen, who is not here, has any questions, she certainly, you know, she, she certainly can follow up with you at any time that she's available to then talk with you about any specific problems that may have come to her attention. Is that right? Yep. yep. Now, so Emery, because Emery's a past, you know, president of the PTA Council, he's been very, very, you know, out front on the issue of transportation and the needs of our students. Emery is also not here, and if Emery has any questions, he also can contact you and follow up on any of those matters directly with you and or your office. Is that is that right? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Now, with regard to our school buses, I want to ask you about the training that our drivers receive. I note that prior to hire, the drivers and attendants receive 40 hours of pre-service classroom instruction, and they get the, uh, the, the minimum of nine hours for that behind-the-wheel instruction. And then Comar requires additional training, six hours of in-service, and it covers a host of things, accidents and policies and procedures and behavior management. Now, I wanted to ask you, because these buses these over 800 buses are extensions of our facilities. What, if any, security-oriented training do our drivers and or our attendants on the buses receive? So the, the training that they receive that's mandated by Comar, some of which you spoke about there, and it, and it does include things like railroad crossings, for example. Sure. They, they make some of that mandatory and so on as well. Um, and that's um, what we will have um, uh, each of it in our summer programs um, of that in-service training. Um, during pre-service um, and in, in our in-service programs, we select topics um, uh, that, uh, rec that, that our drivers and attendants will receive um, information on too. Uh, as far as any actual direct training in you know, safety techniques, etc. Yes, they do as far as uh, driving the bus is concerned, and certain aspects of behaviour management will have some of that te those techniques is concerned. But I'm, I'm not sure if your question is alluding more to sort of uh, any kind of violent activity. Is that is well? That the, the question was security security oriented training that our drivers and or attendants would receive. What, if any, do our drivers and or our attendants receive? Uh, we don't get direct uh, in-service training input at this point in time on 
um, security, but that's certainly an element that we can consider moving forward, yes. I see. Now, I note uh, the, the number of buses that were identified as, as um, being owned directly by our system. Yep. We also use contractors, isn't correct, that correct? Yep. And we that's use correct. contractors' buses. Yep. Now, you made specific mention of our special education routes. Mm -hmm. And um, in the bar graph, we see exactly, you know, how many special education routes that we have. Yep. And we have special education students who may not be on a special education route, but they may ride on one of our, uh, what, you know, for want of a better term, not to suggest one is better or not better, but my just a regular transportation uh, bus route. What I wanted to ask you is when we have a contractor, and we, do we have any contractors that drive special education routes? No, we don't. Okay. All of our special mm -hmm. needs buses, specific yeah. special needs buses, are all BCPS in-house buses. And that is good to know because it, it, it shows specifically, uh, you know, the, the attention that we direct to the needs of our special needs students. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you then for our regular bus routes where we uh, are picking up students at, at different stops and we may have special needs students there. there. Are there contractors that drive some of those routes? So th it is f feasible that a student with special needs can be, you know, riding a general education bus because there isn't a, a requirement in their IEP, if indeed they have an, an IEP, um, for special transportation. So um, many of our general education buses will have students who have a degree of special need on that bus, but it's not necessarily defined in their IEP to have specialised transportation. I appreciate your, you know, your, your the directness of your answer. What I wanted to ask you about is this: to the extent that uh, behavior management is one of the topics that's covered in our in-service training for our Baltimore County employee drivers and attendants, what, if any, behavior management training do our contractor drivers receive? Uh, all our contractor drivers pre-service come to our classes also. Mm -hmm. So. If, you know, if it's one of the contractors that we use, sometimes we'll have a specific class where our trainers work with those contractors or those new contractor, contract, contracted drivers will be part of our classes that we're having for pre-service for our drivers as well. So if the pre-service covered child abuse and neglect, then a contractor's driver would be receiving training in child Correct. abuse and neglect Absolutely. and or in behavior management. Correct. And or sexual harassment, for example. Yeah. And, and they do have to undertake the mandatory in-service training the same because it's state mandated. It's not, it's not just, you know, obviously ours. And we want to follow the state law. Absolutely. Very good. I uh, would like, like to ask you about our drivers and our attendants. Um, what is the starting salary for a new Baltimore County bus driver? Um, uh, step one on the grade um, is, uh, f I want to see to this, uh, whether I'm accurate to the cent. I think it's about $15.79. Give us one second. Uh, Dr. Mail will get us that while we're, while we're, you continue your questions. We right. want to make sure we give you accurate information since this is being live streamed. So and well, give and us one second. And while Dr. Bayo is not under any pressure, to the extent you can identify any benefits that may also go with that hourly wage. Yep, the, so all our, all our full-time staff, um, drivers and attendants, if they're in a full-time 40-hour position, are eligible for uh, retirement and um, health benefits as well. That has been a... Uh, that has been something that we had to work hard at communicating that because a lot of times drivers see $17 an hour, but in some of our competitors, that may be the only thing you see is $17 an hour. Where with us, we offer benefits as well as leave and other things. So we have to really make sure that in our marketing material and working with our um, human resources partners and our other recruiting efforts, we have to really show what our full benefit package is up to and including a host of other packages, a host of other things that the normal um, other, our, our, some of our competitors may not be um, providing thusly. Gotcha. And with regard to our uh, school bus attendance, um, um, I suspect Dr. Mayo can also retrieve that information as well as any benefits for those particular attendants. Yep, they're, they're uh, grade one, step one. Uh, that would be the starting wage which um, for a, a school bus attendant. And grade one, step one is $15 an hour? No, that's, that mm -hmm. would be the school bus driver right. rate. So um, school bus attendant is in the $10. May I suggest that we just yeah. put that in the Friday update instead sure. of trying to and do and a and quiz? And, that, and that's yeah. fine. Very thank good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ed. 
And gentlemen, thank you so much for your presentation tonight. That includes my questions. Thank, thank you. you. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Smith and Mr. Roberts and Mr. McCray for that presentation, but also for your efforts, because um, we know that you have received a lot of input and um, over the two and a half years that I've been on the board about um, concerns and issues related to transportation. So this report is um, clearly the best we've had to date, so I appreciate all the work that you've done on it. Um, I'm also grateful for the legislative audit back that we received in 2015 that did point out that BCPS had owned this uh, transportation software but had not yet implemented it. And I'm so grateful when you were hired that that was one of uh, the issues that you were tasked with and we're moving right along with that. So I appreciate that greatly. And I also want to talk about the relationship between the bus drivers and the students because as you point out, it's really critical. Mm -hmm. First smile of the day, the last have a nice afternoon, uh, as the attendant in the video pointed out, a real personal connection, the bus driver, a real personal connection. I know personally from uh, my own students and their friends, um, developing relationships with bus drivers to the points where the drivers that pick up the extra routes to take the students to after school activities or sports. Uh, in one instance, our own Mr. Jim has been to so many sporting events that when they win uh, county championships or state titles, he's right there in the photo with the trophy because he was such a key part to all those students, not just in getting them there, but sometimes in the agony of defeat, driving them back to the school and giving a little pep talk along with the coaches. So it's very important, and I appreciate the, the emphasis on that. I do have a, a couple quick questions. Um, when you are talking about the um, incidents, um, is it possible, as our chair had pointed out, to perhaps put in the weekly update, how many of those incidents are with students on board versus, like you said, there may have been uh, mirrors hitting in the parking lot or something of that nature? Because I think um, student safety is mission critical. That's the priority. And then the bus damage is secondary. So it would be good to know, especially as we're moving forward in time, seeing that the student safety part, when the students are on board, um, because it does seem like a lot of incidents, but noting how carefully you track them, it would, be, it would be helpful to know, especially as we move forward in measuring the year over year success. We can, we can start to record that data in such, such a way that you know, we can record whether there's students on board in a particular We'll work with the superintendent to provide that on an ongoing basis uh, through the superintendent's office. Okay, thank you. And um, also, in uh, regarding student behavior, um, how do the bus drivers know that their reports of bus incidents are supported by the administration um, in terms of consequences or counseling or restorative practices, in terms of them feeling that they're trying to manage the behavior on the, on the bus, and then what happens with the consequences or the uh, counseling that goes on in the school? How is that done? Are right. there reports of any kind or? Yeah, so it's not drastically different than what happens in a school. So there are bus referrals. So what will happen is a driver can make an oral report, typically followed up by a written report. Know that each school has a liaison, some administrative liaison that's in charge of transportation, an assistant principal who works with drivers and really builds that one-on-one -on -one communication. So that administrator will meet, greet the drivers in the morning, greet them in the afternoon. In some cases with buses dropping off or CTE students for our high school students dropping off in the middle of the day, there's an administrator who works with that bus driver. So a student who commits an infraction, bus driver will submit documentation and referral. And the, Administrator will then handle that just like a classroom referral. We'll investigate, we'll speak with the child, speak with witnesses if they need to, and then issue a logical consequence based on the student handbook. Then that information gets sent back to the bus driver. In some cases, typically we'll come back, when that driver comes back in the afternoon, that assistant principal will communicate with that driver to say, I met with the student, here are the consequences, here's what's happened. Um, in many cases, they'll walk and escort that student to the bus driver and say, look, this is what's happened, this is what's done, and then proceed. From there. So if, there's a, if there are circumstances where bus drivers do not feel that the student behavior is being properly dealt with mm -hmm. um, in, this, in the schoolhouse by the administrators, what pathway do they have to uh, 
express their concern. Right. So then they have their own supervisory chain through Mr. McRae's office. So if they're not satisfied, based on your example, with the consequence issued by the schoolhouse, then they'll talk with their supervisor at the lot, and then that person would call either the assistant principal or the principal to have a conversation about that. Okay, thank you. Because mm -hmm. we have heard of instances of some pretty severe uh, behavior right. problems on buses, and we want to make sure that the bus drivers, when they report those, that they're properly supported and that the logical consequences are, mm -hmm. are carried through. Um, the other thing quickly. Let me just add one other point. Just as it relates to other disciplination, student privacy is important. So sometimes the driver gets an update as it, uh, up to what we can share with that driver. So sometimes they may feel, or that attendant may feel, what, what are the consequences? That's, that's a matter of the school administration working with that student and that individual parent that we want to make sure we still protect the, the privacy of that student or, whoever, or the affected students. Okay, and thank you for clarifying that because student privacy is very important. Um, when you were talking about the on-time measure and you're saying that the morning on-time is 96%, what is the goal system-wide? Is there a, a goal that's set that you're trying to meet or is it just improvement? And, and it is Kevin mentioned at the beginning, um, what we're, we're really looking to do is to establish some real strong baseline metrics for, you know, really, um, Kevin, you used the word fidelity, so that we can really, um, you know, work with Dr. Brown's team, which we're, we're doing currently, to really look at the methods that we record that moving forward and using, you know, some of the, the technological, technological advancements that we've got um, to do that in a better way. Um, because um, manual recording is what it is. It's, it's manual recording. Um, so, um, and we, we really want to use our t the technology that's available to us now to be able to do that in a more effective way. As Mr. McRae stated, I mean, they, we are really optimistic about where we are right now with our technology advances. We are in a position now where we can develop these baseline metrics that we have now so that we can realize continuous improvement. We have metrics related to safety, related to efficiency, re related to kind of on-time um, routes and, and service, the service that we're providing as well. So again, where all of those measures may not have been in place in the past, we're um, positioned now to be able to collect that data and so that we can have on, um, uh, ongoing improvement. Correct. Again, these metrics in all three of these areas we believe are critically important as we continue with our service. Thank you. And then along with that on time, um, what is the afternoon on time? That, that's because of how we've recorded previously. It's not really been something that we've been able to record because it was done on a manual basis. The reason that, we, that, that AM arrival was you could actually record that as the whole bus arrives. So what's on time stop by stop is very difficult to to actually quantify. So again, as I said, we're, we're working with Dr. Brown's team to, to look at ways that we can enhance that in the future. Okay, and some uh, complaints that we've heard are the buses getting to the school to pick the students up. So that would be a knowable starting point is how many buses come to the school on time to pick up the children. And, and, and we're really looking at our um, because uh, as we mentioned in the uh, presentation, the, the deadhead scenario, we are coming from school to school. And as we know, some of our schools, are, are those bus loops are very busy. So, um, and, and we have a few schools where the buses actually go through in three different waves. So that's why we're, we're trying to look at it very carefully with Dr. Brown's team rather than just say, hey, is this bus late or is it in the third wave and it can't get through? So we're, re we're really looking at how we're doing that from a, an operational standpoint and also how we record it effectively because it, it, we may actually not be recording the right thing if we don't take all of those parameters into, into consideration. And okay, this, thank and you. this is important because the superintendent, superintendent mentioned early that we're looking at studying start times, extended day. That affects what we do. So we have to make sure we have data, quality data, accurate data that we can provide as this study is taking place or this, this, this uh, task force is taking place. Now we actually have that data to provide to them on an ongoing basis, AM and PM, as well as knowing where our buses are and where are, where are our gaps, where are some of our gaps, so that as that conversation and discussion continues, we can provide real-time information that will help that discussion move forward in a more timely manner. 
So for me, again, I, I appreciate the target, the um, information about our 96% on time. Again, we want to make sure that we're in a mode of continuous improvement. However, I'm not going to sit here and say that we'll get to 100% on, on time arrival and dismissal because of traffic and traffic accidents and things happen and children get sick on the bus and sometimes they have to return. Those, that's the reality of life. And so we have to make sure that we're accounting for that and that we're realistic in our approach of knowing that things get in the way sometimes. Anytime you drive 695, you can, um, <laughs> and you know that for sure. So again, we have to make sure that we're accounting for that. Our number one goal, is to make sure that we're getting kids to and from where they need to go safely and to make sure that they're behaving themselves on the bus when they're on the bus and that our drivers have um, a plan in place and they have somebody to connect with. Mr. Roberts mentioned an AP. Sometimes it's an AP, sometimes it's a designated teacher, sometimes it's the front office staff. But there has to be some communication to make sure that our bus drivers are heard and that our students and our parents are heard as well. So that call center, the volume, those numbers dropping the way that they do, again, hats off to the staff. That's a lot of calls coming in for, you know, what's my, you know, what, all the various concerns that are, that are going out there. So I do have to mention about that. That 3200, let me be clear, that 3200 could have been a parent saying, I don't know where my kid's stop is. So don't think that's 3200 complaints. Right. That's right. 3200 calls that hit our line. Right. So I wanted to make sure we clarified that because I don't want anybody thinking that we had 3,200 complaints the first week of school. We had 3,200 calls the first week of school. They, could, they run the gamut. Where's my stop? Um, um, whatever, that runs the gamut. And I can appreciate that as a parent, uh, knowing that we don't always read the information and so it, it, you all do a lot of backfilling in on that. Uh, the last thing I have to ask about is, um, because it is important, uh, so important, for the bus uh, recruitment and retention. We know that every time we have to train a new bus driver, it costs additional money. Mm -hmm. We know every time a new bus driver has to start, that relationship has to develop. Um, so I would be interested, and again, this is something uh, the superintendent can consider putting the weekly update, is in your um, chart that you gave us, you were talking about the losses of the bus drivers and then the hiring, mm -hmm. but you have mixed full-time and part-time together. I would like to see that separated but also to know um, from the past years, what is the correlation between our salary and benefits? Because I know that we have made improvements in that area versus us being able to retain. Because if we can see a correlation, if we pay $1 more and we can keep 10% more drivers, well, that may be a dollar that's really worth it. So I would like to be able to have that information for us to make those decisions uh, with the superintendent about what can uh, help us continue with success in this area. Thank you very much. Mr. So, Stewart. Okay. Uh, so I think I'll be brief, but uh, you probably have a sense of what I'm going to ask about, which is policy 3410 as it relates to the pickup and drop off uh, policy. Can you let us know whether that was a policy that was in existence um, prior to this year or the year before? Yeah. Lo long standing yeah. policy. Yeah. And so for clarification's sake, this policy indicates that parents have to provide the same pickup and drop off location when they're allowing the bus to pick up and drop off their kid throughout the week. So you have to have, if you, you can change your mode, you know, you can take the bus on a Monday, you can- right, we'll, we'll get there, but Tuesday. you're saying if you're taking the bus, you have if to be picked up bus, and dropped off. If you're taking the bus, it must be the same bus in the AM and the same bus in the PM. Now those two can be different. So it can be a different PM bus but that can't change throughout the week. You're, right. You have to have the exact same aftercare arrangements and same before school arrangements provided. That's, that's But they can be flexible, brutal. which means you could at least one day have separate transportation. Let's say it's the Y, come and absolutely. pick up your kid and take yep, you back to absolutely. their facility. And, ma and many people do that. So we, we provide a measure of flexibility yes, we do. through our system by doing yeah. that. So one would suspect that given our massive outlay investment of time, energy, and so forth into a modernized system, a, a uh, technical system with um, the right electronic infrastructure that we could provide additional flexibility as it relates to pickup and drop off times. I know you all have faced those issues. We've talked about them from my constituents at least who have brought them up. Um, and I wanted to understand you know, and I have heard your emphasis on the policy as it stands in its purpose, but I also understood that there was a conversation going on internally, a dialogue to be had, and I wanted to see if where we were in that process. 
that, that process is ongoing. We're trying to find what's gonna be the best service delivery with safety being the front, but we're working with our teams, with the school teams, and we are you know, um, going to reach out to parents as well to get feedback as it relates to how can we best make sure that 3410 is, ad is addressing the needs of all students and all parents, but we have to do it in the most efficient manner. So we're, we're still working on that information now. We we're not ready for a report at this particular time. And we, we, did, uh, we did put together, you m we mentioned that we did we put together an internal um, group to look at that, and we have done that. No, actually, we'll be meeting next week. With the internal group, I, and again, um, there are multiple custody arrangements. There are multiple kinds of arrangements that are, you know, done. We have to be as consistent as possible so that we can look a parent in the face and say, I know where your child is. And so we can be flexible, um, but the group, and especially the parent input will be really important on this, and the, um, the staff as well, because we have to have a system that's flexible, but where we still have student accountability. Um, because when we have different arrangements on different days, it's more likely that we would now have a kid on a wrong bus or not know the pickup arrangements or, and such. So our number one goal right there is, is student accountability. So I, I agree that that's paramount, but I'll also say, I'm taking your point that there are different custody arrangements and that we might have a drop-off that needs to be at a different parent's home at one day and, and not the other during that week. And those modes of transportation um, um, can be difficult to navigate. So as we grow as a society, as we grow as, um, as families, you know, in our communities, uh, we do need to be responsive to that, but I'm cognizant of the balance that's being struck here, so I look forward to the work. So before we get Mr. McRae to go catch his bus, there are more <laughs> questions. Yeah, I just have a couple comments. I have a couple of comments. It's interesting that over the years when I've talked to groups, the very first thing I do is try to explain to them uh, the size and scope of the transportation system. And I'm, I'm sure uh, maybe all the board members don't quite fathom. 81,000 kids a day were trained. We're larger than the MTA. And, you know, we have no control over the streets, the traffic. Uh, I've talked to police officers, uh, uh, the corners, the, when, it, when it's ice, it's snow, it's rain, and so forth and so on. Uh, so it's really a huge system, and you guys do a phenomenal job. And if you're only getting 285 calls a week, you're doing a hell of a good job. So don't let the few that come in that uh, we, we always emphasize, you know, the, the, the 20 percent, not the 80 percent. In this case, we all the 4 percent, not the 96 percent. Uh, I, I wanted to say something uh, general to, to something Mrs. Causey said, because over the past several years, I had been involved uh, at, at MABE um, looking at other counties and their systems, and we talk about it in the uh, insurance uh, area about what bus driver is being paid. And, you know, considering that it is a, such an important job. And at one time, I would say three or four years ago, we were on pretty much the bottom of the totem pole. Uh, since that time, um, I remember the superintendent uh, has always asked for more money for bus drivers to increase their pay and to increase their benefits. Um, so, so we've really come a long way in a few short years. Uh, I just wanted to alert you to something really interesting, and I'm going to send this out tomorrow to all your board members. In my, one of my newsletters, the f whole front page is relative to labor across this country, and we have a terrible problem right now. We do not have enough labor to support all the jobs. And interesting, there's a section in there that's telling that employers may have to change the way that we go about hiring. 30 states. Uh, have either authorized um, recreational marijuana or medical marijuana. And if drug testing is a part of the program, somewhere along the line, this is going to become an important factor when it comes to hiring. It also goes into uh, persons with uh, criminal records. And, and so we're going to have to, we got a challenge in the years to come to find adequate uh, employees uh, relative to, to drivers and so forth. And my one technical question is, in your bus accident statistics between preventable and non-preventable, could you break it down to contractors as opposed to our own drivers? Uh, we don't do that at this point in time, but, but we could do. It would seem to me a pretty, move pretty move simple forward. thing. You, yep. you know, a driver is either contracted yep. or employee, yep. and if they're Similarly, involved in an we accident, can, we should be we'll able to. We'll look at our interfaces to. and yep. see how we can 
And okay. I only say that because in, in some counties, uh, most of their uh, drivers are contracted, and, yeah. and I've seen some extensive uh, awards uh, to individuals as a result of accidents, and, and my feeling is that it's pretty much r relative to contracted drivers and not necessarily employee drivers. So, Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Thank you for um, placing the emphasis on safety. Um, a lot of my questions surround around that, but um, could would it be possible for the board to receive a comparison of you know where we how we compare to other districts as far as salary and benefits for bus drivers and attendants? Yeah, maybe we, we can we can get data from other counties. Okay. Yeah. Um, also, uh, re with regard to the behavior management training. Can you talk about how that, what, what's involved in that, and does that address how, how bus drivers address altercations on the bus? Is, is that the purpose of that piece? Right, so I can start with, in terms of altercations on the bus, so what will happen is during those beginning of the year meetings, so school staff, typically the principal, will meet with the bus drivers, invite them in. And at that point, really review the expectations, not just in the handbook, so there's consistency across the entire system with the handbook as the anchor, but then also school expectations. So when it comes to a situation, if a student is misbehaving on the bus, there could be a specific arrangements with, between the administration and the school to say if this happens, in some cases, a bus may come back and a staff member may get on, an administrator may get on that bus and ride the bus home with the kids um, for multiple reasons on that day, to send a message to the students, but also to support the driver and what they're doing. Um, and then if there's specific questions or specific issues, they can go ahead and address those with the students and the parents. That's Mr. McCray is also working with uh, the Office of Professional Develop Development, Billy Burke, in providing and developing more training for our, our tenants and our drivers to enhance what we do already to make sure that um, equal to some of the training and um, uh, professional development teachers are getting as it relates to behaviors and things of that nature, we're trying to incorporate our drivers and attendants into some form of that training all while trying to make sure that the extenuation of what uh, Mr. Roberts said, the school bus is a continuation of the classroom and vice versa, so we're trying to um, push that training out to our drivers and attendants. Once again, it's, we ha we're doing it in a systematic way, and we're still developing and designing that now. And there are things that are consistent throughout. Again, proactively in terms of making sure that everybody understands what the rules are, but most of our bus drivers will have our younger students sit up front, have some of our <laughs> older students sit, sit in the back. Again, trying to make sure that there are safety measures that are put in place before there's an incident. And if there's an incident, what we don't want is for our drivers to be so distracted then they're handling uh, the problematic behavior. Sometimes they'll take the bus back to school mm -hmm. and then make sure that they connect with the, an administrator to hand, handle those um, problematic behaviors. We can't have our bus drivers doing um, both. It's a lot to manage. Yeah, it, it seems like an impossible situation if there is an altercation and there's no bus attendant. Can you describe what the protocol would be for a bus driver if there was a situation like that? I, I, it really is very, it's very <laughs> managing a situation as it presents itself. And obviously our, our drivers and attendants have to be very cognizant about putting hands on anybody at all. So um, really, um, our, our, our driver instructors are, are received train the trainer type uh, information so that when they are giving over um, the information in, in our training classes, um, they're giving you know the sorts of intervention that's appropriate in that situation. Often, and as, as superintendents mentioned, if, if an altercation is to the extent the driver will pull over. Okay, because ultimately, right. So our bus attendants are safe. assigned based on student needs, but usually based yep. on their IEPs. Correct. If they're there, if they need the support, accommodations, those kinds of things, so that they can provide. The our bus attendants aren't referees, and so we just need to make sure that even with a bus attendant on the bus, sometimes that requires that type of altercation or problematic behavior requires those who have had specialized training in dealing with those kinds of behaviors. Mm -hmm. So do any of our attendants have that specialized training? 
I'm saying that our teachers, our administrators who have that, who have certifications in that area with working um, with the developmentally appropriate practices for children, that's many times when they'll circle back to the school so that the administrators and teachers can help with those situations. And, and often our, our bus teams will work with ind the individual teams in the schools to, to you know, get specific information that's going to be helpful for particular students. Even. Um, and that's one of the, uh, our new position is really to work as closely with the schools as well so that we can get more specific information that can help those teams. So basically what I'm hearing is if there was an altercation, neither drivers nor attendants are going to get physically involved. They right? have a degree they of training to, to be able to handle what they can. But if if 911 is the answer, we bring 911 to the bus. Ultimately, the driver's first responsibility is to get the bus to a safe place to address the issue. That's first if no, no attendant is there. Once that happens, then the driver makes an assessment. This is something that I need support on, and I need to either call my dispatch or I gotta call 911. At that point in time, there's a host of factors to take place at that. Once they call the dispatch office, they will get guidance as to what needs to happen, and sometimes that guidance may be take the bus back to the school so the administrators and that per and those personnel who are specially trained in that particular behavior can address it at the school. But there's a host of things that can happen. Ultimately, the first goal is to get that bus into a safe position if you need to address whatever altercation is happening on the bus. Okay. Um, bus capacity, we've heard a lot about that. Um, are, what, is the, what is the bus capacity for the 5,000 series? We operate um, 5,000, or what we call 5,000 series buses, and those are 64, typically 64 passenger capacity. Is um, that three to a seat? That, that would be three to a seat, three and that's the manufacturer's At the elementary capacity. level. Yeah. Okay. And do we have any buses that are operating over capacity? Uh, we we uh, work with the school administrators for any of that information. So um, anytime any of our supervisors are given information, we'll mm -hmm. take um, take that bus and we'll do head counts on a day-to-day -day basis if that's what's necessary to establish the actual ridership number. Let me try to answer that so. a different way. None of our data shows that our buses are overcrowded, but students are students. So if, that, if something happens, we have to work with the administration because if we had a few extra students decided to ride because basketball practice got canceled, we, we, we have to react to that or know how to deal with that. So none of our buses on paper are overcrowded based on how we operate. But there are fluctuations due to when seasons end and begin and stop, practices cancel, it may have a, an impact on buses or other activities that a student that maybe should have written another bus, wrote another bus. So we, we work with the administration. We understand children are children. We, we, don't, we don't hold that against them, but we still have to make sure that we're trying to operate an effic efficient and effective system. We're trying to make sure that we're maximizing as much as possible the utilization for that bus, because what we would hate not to have, or to hate to have a bus that had 11 students on it at 64 capacity. It just doesn't appear to be efficient. So it's a, it's a wide range, but not, none of our routes on paper, but that could fluctuate depending on what activity is happening at the schools. So your routes are designed to avoid any overcapacity. Correct. That's so any, any you know, times that it is overcapacity, it's going to be seldom. It's not going to be a regular thing on any We're given We're going to work bus. with the school. That's, the the case, and then that's when we would work with the school closely for any numbers, yeah. Right. Okay. How about on drive times? There's been some talk about some of the long drive times. Has that been corrected? What are, you, are your longest drive times at this point? Yeah, we, we look very carefully at our ride times, for, particularly for our special needs students. Um, I, again, as we mentioned in the presentation, it's very, you know, if, if, the, if the student's program is in Columbia, Maryland, we have to go to Columbia, Maryland. We have to take a student quite a long way. Um, and it, it, while we individualize some of that service, we still do need to have pickups of numbers of students as well. Um, so um, we look carefully at our ride times pretty much on a, an individualized and a route by route basis. Um, there, there isn't a here's the maximum ride time, there isn't one in the state. Um, so 
Um, what we're, uh, it's another continuous improvement situation, but we do have to optimise the use of our buses as well. Um, mm -hmm. and we work very closely with the state on that too. And that, that process has got improved by some of the efforts of this board allowing us to have that special ed liaison, because that person is in the room with the IAT, IEP team committee to say, bear in mind that that's, that's going to be a, a 108 hour minute transportation so that you know they can kind of get the gravity of it before that decision is made that maybe we need to look at some other program locations or program options so that we can minimize that so that's definitely helping working with our special ed community our special ed team to make sure we're addressing that okay um, let's see what is the procedure for a parent to review bus video and is there a limited window to do that so um, when you go to so parents, so if they want to review a bus video, if there's an altercation or there's something that their child's involved in, that's a request that would go typically through the school, through the school principal. Um, and then the school principal will work with staff from Mr. McRae's office, but understanding that as Mr. Um, Smith mentioned earlier with privacy rights, uh, there's limitation to which parent or which parents can view what based on the privacy of other students on the bus because the, the shot, if you've ever seen one, it's just a shot of the bus. It doesn't zoom in particularly on a particular incident or a student. So that parent would work with the principal and we would work with Mr. McRae's office to coordinate that. So you're saying if there's an altercation and a parent wants to view their child was victimized, if they want to view the video, they can't if it shows any other students? Right, so they can work with the principal to view the video. So there's not a way to black out other faces, but they can view portions of the video that involve their child. And they would work with the staff of transportation to do that and come into the school and do that. I think that needs some work. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like almost impossible to um, view anything I'll, when you're I'll talking say it about this a way. bus. Wait. School student safety, student privacy is what we define it to be. So we can't have it one way one time and one way another time. We have to administer that consistently. So I agree with what you're saying. It's difficult. But what we ask the parents is to work with our Office of Transportation and the school administration to help come to a some kind of an amenable uh, solution to the problem. It may not just be we hand the tape over and you view the entire thing. We, we Student privacy sometimes ties our hands as to what we can give. Sometimes that feels like a deficit to the parent who wants to see it all, but that, that's unfortunately that's that's the pendulum that we're on, and that's how we have to deal with that. And we're certainly trying to improve that on an ongoing basis, but we do have to be mindful of the fact that privacy, student privacy, relates to all students. Every student has privacy, regardless of what the facts may be. So what that what they would have to do is look at which students are in the video and see if the parent has opted them out? Because if they haven't, then it could be viewed, correct? Once again, we, we, we ask that the parents work with the school administration, the Office of Transportation. It's not that cut and dry that we could say it's a, it's a case by case basis. We just can't give you that answer and then that applies to all. Once again, student privacy is what this board has asked us to focus on and we're trying to focus on that while still trying to make sure that we have transparency as it relates to those issues that come up. So we'll, it's on a case by case basis. We just can't give you a, a blanket answer for that. It, it seems like student privacy is, well, I mean, that's all spelled out. So it should be a blanket answer. You know, there are certain rules that are going to govern student privacy. So if parents have opted out of the, you know, 52, whatever the form was, 5202, whatever it is, mm -hmm. then you wouldn't be able to view it. But if they have not opted out, then it seems that they would be able to. Once again, it's based on a case-by-case -case basis, and it would depend on working with the administration and the Office of Transportation with that parent. Could the board receive more information on what factors go into that case-by-case? -case? We'll work with the superintendent. To, to we, can, we, we can give more information on it. Yep. I guess we would need to know, again, the specifics. I, I hear your question. There are, again, multiple factors that we have to consider. We, we're assuming that those requests are coming from folks who are operating in good faith. Sometimes we have folks who are not operating in good faith, who are looking to do 
some harm for some odd, uh, odd reason. Again, the student privacy issue, the safety issue is of paramount concern as well. We want parents to know what happened with their students. There's no need to withhold any that type of information, but we have to do so in a reasonable and responsible way. I think that's why the team, you know, again, it has to be individualized on a case-by-case -case basis on what happened, what the uh, video captured, and who's involved in it, and what the request is. So it is not just a blanket cut and dry answer. I think it's one that is quite complicated. We can certainly work with our legal team to provide additional information on what we currently do. Um, and what those parameters are, and we can provide that in a weekly update. Okay, I'd appreciate that. Let me just see if I have any other questions here. Um, can you can you tell for the public what is the phone number for the call center? Yep, it's 443-809-4321. Okay, and um, I, I think the rest have been addressed. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Ms. Cause you have the last question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you for all the information. Thank you for your questions. Um, I was just wondering, um, Mrs. White, in terms of the complicated issue of student privacy, but also student safety, uh, would it be appropriate at any time if a parent asked for uh, the principal to have the SRO um, review the tape of the bus? That's someone that it has um, an official role in the school system, but if they're, if, because, you know, the concern would be if the student is um, in, in a situation where another student is harming them, and then that would be appropriate to have some level of review um, by, a, by an official person in the school system. If the SRO is involved, it's a police matter. And uh, again, so we do then look at what's a police matter separately than what's an administrative matter. Many times our administrators will then call on our SROs to, to handle certain matters. So if it's a police matter, then we let the police handle it in the way that they do. If it's an operational uh, administrative matter, then we, um, uh, we handle it in that way. Thank you. And even the, if the police are, are looking to get footage, they would subpoena that. So it's actually becomes... We've kept you over time. Thank you. Uh, we, uh, we had targeted that you were going to be done at 8.30. It's now sneaking up on 10 o'clock. Uh, but despite that, neither you nor your transportation department are getting a late slip. The buses nope. must run on time tomorrow. You've got to go in time, yep. All righty. Thank you all very much. Next on our agenda is uh, uh, committee updates. Uh, Mr. Yulfelder, audit. Uh, the audit committee met and did its normal review and uh, we're going to attempt to see if there's uh, some more detailed information uh, that we'll be able to bring to the board relative to some of the um, things that the audit uh, team, the internal audit team does without violating uh, any uh, privacy. As you might expect, most uh, infractions involve employees and um, it becomes kind of difficult. So we're trying to put together some data that, that we can release and to give you an idea of the, the size and scope of the internal audit function. Very good. Uh, building the contracts. No update. Building the contracts, no update. Curriculum. Thank you. Uh, the curriculum committee met on February 15th. We discussed a number of items. Uh, we talked about how we pilot uh, curriculum, the process that's used, um, the curriculum workshop that will take place this summer. Um, and uh, I do want to alert the board that we did also review a number of course name changes and additions and subtractions. A lot of them had to do with alignment with MSDE terminology. But within the next couple of weeks, you'll be getting a package. I'll try to alert you again. They'll have a number of course changes and descriptions. And I just want to make sure board members have enough time to look at all that information before we have to confirm it uh, at our full board meeting. So I'll make sure we do that. Thank you. Uh, digital technology safety. Yes, thank you. The, the um, Safety and Technology Committee meets uh, only quarterly, and our next meeting will be March 28th. Um, I'm going to be raising the issue that was uh, previously mentioned by a stakeholder in public comment. It was regarding the recent use of BCPS student images by our previous superintendent in, on his consulting company's website. Um, I am also still waiting for estimates of student screen time in the classroom. 
Policy Review Committee. Uh, thank you, Ed. The uh, Policy Review Committee met on February 12th. I was not there. I had a uh, virus. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, ABLE Vice Chair uh, was able to um, uh, vice chair the meeting. Policies were recommended, I'm told, by the committee for first reading at uh, an upcoming uh, board's um, future agenda. The committee's uh, next meeting will be on uh, March 12th. And I am advised that the committee was able to get out on time. Outstanding job, Chuck. <laughs> we have a public hearing tomorrow on uh, the proposed boundary for the new Northeast, Northeast Area Elementary School, um, Perry Hall Middle School at 6.30. Our next board meeting is March 6th. We're adjourned. <laughs>